Okay. Yeah. Just put it down here. Okay. And then this is the clipper. So I take it for a test run. So, so that put that way. Yeah. Okay. So point it towards that thing. Okay. That's good. Stuff. See, that's why we're doing it. We're taking it for a test run. The, the clicker isn't working. Oh, the clicker's working. Now. Okay. I don't need a mic. Good morning. Want to get back there? Hey, all right, very good. Uh, Today, you guys are going to witness our senior interns uh, presentation from the Blue Ridge High School Government School. We've got a lot of kids who've done a lot of hard work. And uh, we're going to get started now. And first off is Katie Ross, who's going to present on the critical planning and its impact on small communities. Katie, come on up. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jamie, and my senior project is on sustainable agriculture and its impact on the environment on both a local and national level. So to begin, I did my project on this mainly because of my sister. So she changed her major from teaching to sustainability a little while ago. And ever since then, ever since she came home, every time I would get a lecture, Jamie, you're using too much plastic, you're not recycling. And eventually, that led to me learning a lot about sustainability. And as well as I've lived in Savannah for all 17 years of my life. So that means that I know someone who has a garden, I have a garden. Agriculture is really, really big in the community. And so I thought about sustainability and agriculture and both of those things and how they impacted our community. So to begin, I want to talk about what sustainable agriculture is. So it's not getting rid of the food that we have and it's not making less of it. It's just making it in a way that is healthy, healthier for the environment, so we can continue to make the food we have now at the level we make it now. And I thought this quote, there must be a better way to make the things we want, a way that doesn't spoil the sky or the rain or the land, was really impactful and really spoke about sustainable agriculture, because it's not like we're getting rid of anything, we're not making less of anything, we're just figuring out a way to do it that isn't harmful. So for my research, I focus mainly on sustainable agriculture practices. And on the left, you can see a diagram, and that's hydro, hydroponics. And so hydroponics are a system of sustainable agriculture that uses water instead of soil. So the plant roots are placed in water. And so the deep root flow is a practice of hydroponics. And so that practice puts the roots of the plants into a nutrient-based water solution. And so the benef benefits of this include a lower water level, so you can keep recycling the water and not use as much, which makes it a little bit more sustainable, as well as it, you don't have to use herbicides or pesticides, making it less, more of an eco economic thing, because you don't have to use as much money. And on the right, you can see that there's no-till agriculture, and so that's another practice where you don't use machinery to cut and erode the whole thing. You just use one slit and place the seed and place it back, and that reduces erosion in a very high way. So for my internship, I interned at Cocoa and Spice, and that was, it's a little shop on the downtown mall. My mentor is Jennifer Moad, and she is really focused on creating a sustainable way to make her products. So as you can see in these pictures, it, from the left to the right, we started with cocoa beans, and those are from a small farm in Costa Rica. And those are from, the farm is really focused on learning about sustainability and using sustainable practices to get their cocoa beans. And so we began with the cocoa beans and then after that, the second picture is all of them cracked up. And so from there, it's like air pulls out like the shells, but makes the cocoa nibs fall down. So you're able to get just solid chocolate like you can see in the third picture. And then after that, in the fourth part, that's just the bar after it's been dried. And so the final part of my internship, we were able to do like a tasting. And so that was a lot of fun because everyone was able to come in and see what we did with the internship. 
and you can see the honey over there. Maybe I can't. Um, the honey over there was made by my mom, and we were able to use the honey and implement it in the chocolate, and that was a lot of fun. So my community service was done in two parts. One of them is ongoing, and one of them is finished. So the finished part was a trash pickup around the community. My mentor was Amy Richardson, and she was just, she's very passionate about environmental science. She's my environmental science teacher. And she was just super excited to help me, and she gave me a lot of resources. And so I was able to learn about, you know, places to pick up trash, how to do it in an impactful way. And I was able to pick them up in areas around the county that I was interested in. And so that was a lot of fun for me. And I was just happy to be able to give back a little bit. So the second part of my community service that's ongoing is I'm working with Jackson Kinsella and we are planning a field day for the Boys and Girls Club in Scottsville. And we are really excited about this because mainly these kids are in poverty. So they don't really get the chance to learn about, you know, sorry, to learn about um, health and stuff. So we're gonna just give them the information that they need. And so my portion of that is I'm gonna teach them about sustainable farming habits and give them like plants and stuff to get them excited about that stuff and hopefully they'll enjoy it. So for my future plans, I either want to go into engineering at Penn State or NC State. I'm not quite sure which one, hopefully one of them. Um, but if I don't go to one of those, then it'll be definitely another four year university with engineering. So through this project, I learned that agriculture is probably not gonna be a career choice for me. It was fun to work with for Moad and she really connected me with a bunch of different people, like the farm where we got the beans from Costa Rica. She connected me with that farm and we were able to talk to them about their sustainable farming practices. And so that was really interesting. And as well as Amy Richardson, she just connected me with a bunch of people around the county that could help me with the trash pickup. And I also learned how to work independently. Um, as much as help as I got from my mentors, I had to do a lot of work on my own, like find my own internship, find my own community service. And so I was really excited to just be able to figure out that those were things I was able to do on my own. So things I would do differently in this project, I would probably start my community service and make the impact a little bit larger. I would probably start it earlier um, because while I enjoyed my community service, I definitely could have gone a little bit bigger. And while I think it was still impactful, I think it could have been a little bit more helpful to the community. So advice for future seniors, I would say, for the first two, take your time and start early. So when you start early, you're able to really make plans. And those plans can, you know, they might fall through, but if you start early, then you can make other plans and just continue on as well as you can. And focus on all parts of the project because there's the research and the community service and the internship, and they're all equally important. And while you might do them at different times in the year, they all have equal importance in the project as well as using your resources, because there are just so many out there, like the governor's school website, your mentors and everything. They were just very, very helpful to me throughout this whole project. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Um, so they all were kind of helpful in different ways, like they all were impactful in different ways, like the no-till farming really helped with erosion, while the hydroponics really helped with water use. So they were all really helpful, but the hydroponics were really, really helpful with water use because that's a really big problem right now in the environment. So I'd say probably between the two of those, hydroponics. Yeah, so no till I, so hydroponics is a little bit expensive. Just the whole practice and is just a lot of money. So the no-till agriculture is used a little bit more for sure because it's just it's just having different holes in the ground. And so that one is used a little bit more than the other ones. Um I don't think so. This is a very important subject and I don't know if that's something that I would be able to do but um, I think mechanical or architectural yes um, 
yeah, so we are planning on doing like a bounce house and having different stations. And with each station, we'll each take a group of kids and talk to them about what our projects are. His project is a little bit differently than mine, so he's going to take a different subject. And so I'm just planning on teaching them about what I learned about sustainability. And then I hope to just, you know, have some activities for them to make it a little bit more interesting than this might be. presentation is on the link. Okay. Yeah. Hey guys. Um, please don't change out of your outfits. We do want to take a, a group picture. So I'm not sure what time we'll do that at. So just Y'all look so nice. All right. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. Hey, everybody. My name is Jackson, and my project, like Mr. Morrison said, was on education policy. And if you want to follow along on my website, which has more in-depth information about my project that correlates with this presentation, that's a QR code where you can scan it and do so. So just a little bit about me. I really am very interested in education. And I started to become interested in education around late 2021 and early 2022 when there was a lot of political and partisan debates going on at school boards in our county and throughout the state of Virginia. And I was sort of disheartened by this because education is such a specific granular topic that is so wide reaching and has such heavy impacts on communities. And I thought that that partisan nature sullied the, nation, the nature of education. And I wanted to find out how we could implement good nonpartisan education that allows each and every child to unleash their full potential. 
And so to better understand that education policy, because like I said, it's a broad topic, I identified three prongs that I wanted to do research on and immerse myself within. The first one is the prong of theory. Why does education policy work the way it works? Why do children drop out of school? Why are more teachers hired? After I understood the theory, the why behind education policy, I wanted to get into realization. I wanted to be in the community, immerse myself, and realize where needs were. And then once I realized the why and the who, I wanted to see how that education policy could be better implemented within our federal public education system. And so to start better understanding education policy, that why, that first prong, I reached out to Jennifer Locasale Crouch, who is a professor at the University of Virginia Curry School of Education. I was reading one of her articles and was very interested and began my research internship studying education theory, specifically early childhood interventions at the Curry School. And these are just some photos of the Curry School. And some more photos, Ridley Hall was where the research would take place. That conference room right up there is where the research team would meet. I was able to take part in some published research. Uh, and then that's just me at the Curry School as well. And so these were my mentors at the Curry School. The really big photo right there, that's Jennifer Locasale Crouch. She has her PhD in early childhood interventions from the University of Florida. Jennifer Locasale Crouch published the Castle System, which is used by pre-kindergarten educators all over the nation to score childhood readiness. The entire state of Arizona uses the literature she wrote. So it was a real honor to intern under her. In the middle is Caroline Chamberlain. She was the government liaison on the research team. She was in charge of making sure that the money that the state of Virginia had appropriated to the research team was being used properly. And so she taught me about government relations. And then right there, that's Tekka Lanahan. He was the numbers guy. He was in charge of that data-driven communication to communicate to policymakers the very specific and pixelated information that was being gleaned from the research. And so before I could actually start the research, I had to meet up with Dr. Locasale Crouch and earn her trust. And so I drove to the Curry School and got very lost because I'm terrible at driving. And once I got to the Curry School, she invited me to attend the National Early Childhood Education Conference. And it was over Zoom and the research team would be presenting the research because when I hopped on the research team, the research was already complete. It was just going through the rigorous peer review process. And so I attended the Zoom and met totally different people from all over the world. There were researchers from Shanghai, uh, leaders from the CDC, uh, tribal members from the Navajo Nation, and it allowed me to realize the true community aspect of education policy making and policy stakeholders. And so then I was able to really dig into the research. And the research that the research team was doing was totally novel and unique. It was the first of its kind. Right up there in the bottom left corner, that's Nelson County. And if you can see the blue lines right there, those are zip code boundaries. Think of like a community tract or a census tract. And unfortunately, much of the information, the data that education policymakers are working off of is based on the census tract. But if we're working to improve education, we don't care about the neighborhood, we care about the school district itself. And so the team came up with a novel statistical and computer science method to translate information from zip code boundaries to that school attendance boundary that we see up there. They overlaid the infinite contours of different communities to make sure that each and every school district, not neighborhood, was heard. And this is just that formula. I'm not going to explain it all, but that big E right there, that just means summation. And what they're doing is they're adding the P percentage times the Childhood Opportunity Index. That's that student metric that is measured by zip code, measuring nutrition, early childhood readiness, et cetera. And they're just adding that all together infinitely to account for the infinite contours of each zip code and school district. And then they're dividing that by a nice round constant so we can have a number that is workable. And in the end, the research team was able to come up with this super cool map. And I could take forever to explain it. But what I want you to understand is the darker the blue is the more early childhood educational opportunity. And we're not really surprised because right up there in Northern Virginia and Fairfax and Loudoun County, we see a lot of COI scoring that's very, very high by school district. And what I mean by COI scoring, like I said before, is how much literal opportunity does each child have to succeed in school? Right down there in the center in the upper left corner, you'll see another big dark blob, blue blob. That is Western Albemarle County, another county with a high tax base, heavily white Asian community. And then when we get into the what they call the Black Belt of Southern Virginia or the Appalachian region of Southern Virginia, we're able to see white scoring, lower childhood opportunity. And then they correlated that via segregation. They wanted to see, hey, how segregated, how racially diverse, how economically diverse, how economically segregated does it correlate with a COI score per district? And to do that, they used another formula. 
it could take forever to explain, but what they're doing is they're accounting for student characteristics, how white, how Hispanic, how Asian, how Native American is a community. They're creating a constant that measures those student characteristics. They're adding in the earlier constant that measured COI scoring by school attendance boundaries. So now we're accounting for the wealth and other contextual factors in the community. And then right down there on the bottom, we're adding in two measures of segregation. And segregation isn't legal in Virginia, so I don't want you to think that schools are purposely being segregated. What I mean by segregation is how diverse is a district. And segregation can also occur on a socioeconomic level based on income. And those two segregation measures were entropy and exposure. And entropy basically deals with, I use trees as an example, how thick is the forest? How much of Hispanic Americans are in a certain district? How many Asian Americans are in a certain district? It's studying the concentration. Exposure, on the other hand, studies the distribution. How diverse and integrated are the different races within each district? And their findings were that, yes, segregation does have an effect on childhood opportunity. And once I started to better understand those findings, I was able to start attending research meetings. And this is me on a Zoom call with the research team, and that's the computer program that would run all those contours and give COI scoring and segregation scoring per, per school attendance boundary. And I realized on those Zoom calls that some of that data is actually classified. And so I, understood, I learned in this project that although student achievement data, which may seem very vague and bland, it still belongs to the state. It doesn't belong to us as the researchers. And we ought to respect the integrity that students and school districts place in researchers. And that's why it's pixelated out, is because the data that I was observing was classified. So I got to learn about the research classification process as well. And so after I understood the research better, uh, Dr. Locasiel Crouch assigned me to write a research brief on the research manuscript that was the long published paper that was being uh, published in the Frontiers Journal. And a research brief is basically like an extra long abstract. And that is currently working through the Curry School of Education and will be published probably later this year. So superintendents and principals can understand the research in a more vernacular, understandable format. And so after I did my research internship, I started my actual research itself. I met with Dr. Locasiel Crouch to start brainstorming ideas. And I came up with a research question. Was there a noticeable decrease in magnet school applications, Blue Ridge, Virginia Governor School applications, during the COVID-19 pandemic? And to define Blue Ridge as a magnet school, I had to do a little research. And I was able to define Blue Ridge as a magnet school because it was composed of those multiple different school attendance boundaries, as we see up there. Blue Ridge is number three, and we can see it composes multiple different school districts. It's a consortium, and that's consistent with Virginia code standards of defining a magnet school. And so what I did is I contacted Ms. Elliott, and I got a bunch of data on COVID-19 applications with regards to the Blue Ridge Virginia Governor's School. I got data on how many people applied in 2019 to 2020, during COVID itself, and after COVID. And I correlated that by socioeconomic status, plus or minus 10% above the poverty line, where do people fall? And then along with marginalized status, how many white slash Asian Americans applied versus how many Hispanic American, Black Americans, and uh, Native Americans applied to the school. And as you can see, it seems like in the middle, there was a noticeable decrease in marginalized applications during the COVID-19 pandemic. But researchers can't operate off of visualizations. We have to operate off of firm research data. And so now I had to figure out a statistical technique to prove my observation. I wanted to use latent growth curve analysis, which pulls in all those factors. Unfortunately, that requires a supercomputer, and I was not able to do so. So I turned to the simple t-test. And a t-test basically compares the result of one time versus the result of another time and sees if a treatment had a noticeable effect. Unfortunately, to perform a t-test, I need data that's in a list format. I need data for each and every student in the school, but I don't have that type of data. And so the data doesn't have spread. And unfortunately, that would have caused me to have a non-existent or asymptotic t-test. And so it was the night my research paper was due. I had no evidence to prove my observations. But then I found a test online literally called the simplest test. And it's used by cardiologists to prove the efficacy of pharmaceutical drugs. So I picked my pharmaceutical drug to be COVID-19, and I picked the cardiological event to be Blue Ridge applications. And I just compared event A to event, event B, and I realized I needed a score of 1.96 to prove that there was a noticeable change in application volume. And I found that there wasn't in marginalized students or in poor students. However, there was a large, dramatic increase, nearly by a factor of two, of students as a whole applying during COVID-19 and after COVID-19 
versus before COVID-19. And that perplexed me because I was like, why are people applying in a higher frequency during a moment, that, a moment that's hindered with administrative burdens and people being out of school? And I came to the conclusion, I found online, like I said, 77% of students during COVID-19 had a negative perception of online learning. Why would they want to apply to a virtual governor's school? However, a study out of Saudi Arabia found that 78% of magnet school students wanted and actively pursued online learning. And it seems that the attitude of the average applicant to the Blue Ridge Virginia Governor's School outpaced the negative perceptions that normal students face. And that's why they were able to sort of blunt the curve of COVID-19. Furthermore, ladies and gentlemen, they were able to move beyond the administrative burdens that COVID-19 perpetuated during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm talking about things that make it difficult for students to learn, difficult for them to be in school. And that was because of the structure of Blue Ridge itself. And there's data out of the National Institutes of Health that shows when you incentivize parents, when you bring them robocalls, when you send them texts and emails, when you reach out to stakeholders, that they're more likely to vaccinate their children. And the data that Ms. Elliott provided me from the governor's school application process made clear that governor's school does reach out to school counselors and does send robocalls during the application process. So it seems that there is administrative infrastructure to blunt the administrative burdens of COVID-19. And so now I wanted to bring that digital intervention, that digital structure to areas that had lower COI scores and did not blunt the curve of COVID-19. And so I started to volunteer at the Boys and Girls Club, which is in Scottsville, Virginia. And they serve, if you see right down there, that white county, that is a Buckingham County and they have a very low childhood opportunity index score. And so I was interacting with students who did not have access to those digital pieces of technology to better blunt COVID-19. And so I started to gain their trust before I could be doing uh, more in-field community service and really introducing them to digital technologies. And then once I did so, I taught the kids simple Java coding techniques over about three um, in-person sessions to better acclimate them to digital technologies. And while I was doing so, I realized that other things were lacking at the school as well. And so then I wanted to throw up a uh, field day for the students to better boost the holistic COI environment that exists within those low COI counties. I'm talking nutrition, literacy, et cetera. And so I started reaching out to local health partners in the community, UVA Primary Care, Jefferson Pharmacy, um, a healthy eating clinic in uh, Spring Creek, and they started giving me money so I could throw this field day, buy a bounce house, introduce children to healthy, happy lifestyle activities. And currently we've raised around $750 to implement that goal. And I'm working with Jamie Roth, who's gonna teach them about those nutritional aspects of healthy, happy living. And this is just me on a Zoom call with Cardale. He's the team leader at the Boys and Girls Club in Scottsville, Virginia. And you can see Jamie up there too. And we've been working really diligently with him to implement our field day on April 7th. And so then I wanted to do just a little mini internship at the end of that to see where does the government step in with regards to education equity and education outcomes. And so I reached out to Professor Kimberly Jenkins Robinson from the University of Virginia School of Law. And she is a renowned expert in the field of education law. And these are just some photos of me at the law school. I've attended three classes there so far. That's the classroom where Dr. Jenkins Robinson would teach. And that is the admissions office where I would log in every day, check in every day. And that's me looking really stressed before I went into the law school. And so we talked about two specific cases, and I'll go over them really quickly, that allow me to realize the inequities perpetuated within education funding. So the case San Antonio versus Gonzalez basically says, this was a big part of the class, that there does not need to be equal funding for school districts. And so what's happening is we're seeing that topography and COI scoring among school districts. Those with higher tax bases are boasting higher COI scores, and those with lower tax bases are boasting lower COI scores. And we need to blunt that by obeying sort of the message of Horton versus Meskel, which is a case that deals with the state of Connecticut, which mandates that in the state of Connecticut, there does need to be equal funding. And when there is equal funding, we're able to see better outcomes because believe it or not, magnet schools, such as the Blue Ridge Virginia Governor School, aren't appropriated money district by district. They're appropriated money in a block format that deals with all the consortium of school attendance boundaries. Yet again, showing how they were able to rise above administrative burdens perpetuated by COVID-19. And so with that, I want to give you all some advice as you move on to do your project. Be the best you you can be. Don't try to do something to impress people. Don't try to do something that you think fits your college application. When you start to do this project, pick something you're passionate about and do it 100%. And you will do it 100% because you care about it and you want to make it something that you're proud of. And that's something I would tell myself too if I was starting off in my project. I would often try to compare myself to others. I'd always be looking at other people's websites. Don't do that. 
Do what makes you happy, and if it makes you happy, it's going to be amazing. And so with that, I look forward to going to Stanford University this fall to further study education policy. Thank you. That's it. Questions? I, more let me towards the education aspect of public policy. I've always been interested in public policy, sort of using, you know, like numbers to make societal decisions, but it definitely opened my eyes to the dense amount of work you can do in education, for sure. Yeah, Ms. Yeah, I'll be published, and my name will be on it, and I'll be published with the research team, which is really exciting. I think, as of late, Tekka says some people at uh, UVA are still peer-reviewing it to make sure it's accurate. Thank you, I appreciate it. Oh yeah, sorry, my bad. Um, I wonder if you went out into um, how do you think that your research has impacted our education? Um, well, like I, I don't know if I, maybe I can like scroll way back to the map, but education has a higher, uh, not education, uh, Fluvanna has a higher COI score. Uh, it's in the upper matrix, we have a very high tax base because of Lake Monticello, a large retiree community. And so there's not necessarily that large need um, in the county itself, but there is not multiple school districts in Fluvanna. And so perhaps we're not measuring the topography of different COI outcomes in students. For instance, you know, the South Side and Fork Union, Scottsville, probably a lower COI just demographically than Palmyra and the sort of exurban communities and developments. Sandy didn't. I don't. I'm alive. some questions. Uh, these kids have put a lot of work into this and they know a lot about their topic. Um, and so asking questions is good because they can uh, impart some knowledge to you. You can have some to learn from them a little bit. Uh, maybe some of the BRBGS kids in here and they can have some questions about how to prepare and uh, about their projects themselves. So feel free to ask questions. Okay? All right, without further ado, we're going to bring up this Emily Jackson who is going to talk a little bit about care. Thank 
Gentlemen, come on up. Hi everyone, so my name is Emily Jackson and I'm gonna be talking about physical therapy. Um, specifically, I decided to focus on therapeutic modalities and their impact on physical therapy. So before I tell you exactly what therapeutic modalities are, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I decided on this project. So at the beginning of last May, when I began searching for my internship, physical therapy was a huge interest of mine. I was considering pursuing it in college and so I thought this would be a great opportunity to learn more about it. Um, I began reaching out to clinics, and one of the main things that I was able to do in the clinic that I interned at was work with modalities because I am not licensed to be a physical therapist. So more about therapeutic modalities. Um, last year, I took a class here at the high school called sports medicine, and we learned a lot about them in that class. And so through talking to my mentor, we both decided that this would be a great topic to research since it's a new technology that's really just coming into play in the last 20 years. So therapeutic modalities are therapy technologies that are used to help in recovery. And this can be very basic things such as ice and heat, but also more high tech technologies that you see professional athletes using such as cryo chambers and cold lasers. So this is a quote that I use to represent my project. And it says that movement is a medicine for creating change in a person's physical, emotional, and mental states. The reason I chose this quote is because my mentor really stressed to me that it's not just about physical healing, but also mental healing. There's lots of frustration and emotion that comes with any injury, and so we wanted to make sure that patients were not just physically okay, but also mentally prepared to get back into the activities that probably injured them in the first place. So now moving into my research, I decided to focus on the research question, how have therapeutic modalities influenced rehabilitation? and I found that they do this in one main way. Therapeutic modalities speed up recovery time, which is why they're so liked in physical therapy. So when your body gets injured, it starts a natural healing process that's broken up into three basic stages. Inflammatory stage describes the basic swelling a few days after an injury. The repair stage is when muscles, ligaments, and tendons begin to repair themselves and the remodeling stage, which takes up to about two years, is when the tissue begins to remodel itself back to its healthy form. Modalities are typically used within these first two stages of injury, so that's what I decided to focus on in my research. I found that these modalities typically speed up the biological processes that your body would go through anyways. So there is modalities targeted for inflammation, such as cryotherapy, which helps push the fluid away from an injury so your body can move into the repair stage that much quicker. In the repair stage, there's modalities targeted for muscle strengthening and re-education, which helps you get back on your feet and back to your activities, sports, or work that much quick, quicker. Excuse me. Now, moving into my internship. So as I mentioned before, I interned at a physical therapy clinic, Pivot Physical Therapy in Charlottesville at their Pantops location. My mentor was Dr. Hannah Duff, who is pictured on the left. She has been in the fields of physical therapy for about six years, all six of those years at Pivot. The past two years, she has been serving as the clinic director, so she's sort of the head physical therapist there. Now, one of the limitations that I faced almost immediately was patient confidentiality. And one of the ways that Pivot helps patients feel more comfortable is through offering private sessions. And so I was obviously not allowed to sit in on these sessions. So while my mentor was in those sessions, I got to shadow and work with Jeff Whitwer, who is a physical therapist assistant pictured on the right. He is currently in school at Radford and has been working with pivot clinics all over Virginia for just under a year. Some of my main tasks at my internship included working with the therapeutic modalities. So this meant using ice and heat on patients, but also setting up electrical stimulation machines and ultrasound machines for my mentor to use. My other task was to create home exercise plans, which are basically just packets of exercises that are adapted versions of the exercises patients were doing in the clinic anyways. I would also prepare the equipment that the patients got to take home with these exercises. So this was just weight balls and resistance bands, things of that nature. Um, my community service was served in two separate parts. 
So the first part was with uh, Mr. Tyler Golden, who is the athletic trainer here at Fluvanna County. And he also teaches the sports medicine class that I mentioned earlier. I worked with him on creating the posters seen on the right to tell students about the modalities that we have here in our athletic training clinic. So this is one of the examples of the posters for an ultrasound machine. And the ultrasound machine is what Tyler is holding in on the left. And each poster detailed what the modality was, what injuries it could be used for, and what it shouldn't be used for. And these were not only for just general athlete knowledge, but also to use as a teaching resource for his class, which he does often take to the training room to get a more hands-on experience with athletic training. The second part of my community service was done with Travis Bishop, who is the owner of a company called Bishop Events. Bishop Events sponsors races all over the DC and Virginia areas. And I got the pleasure of working with him at two separate races. So the one pictured on the screen was the Heritage 5K and 10K in Charlottesville, Virginia at a local winery. And some of my tasks just included at the beginning of the race, I was helping with registration and passing out t-shirts and getting people set up for the race. And after I spent a lot of my time helping with wrapping injuries and preparing ice packs for the runners to take with them on their way home. I also got to talk with many different runners, which was a really cool experience because some of them have been running with Bishop Events for many years and had done well over 100 races. These people range all the way from middle school up until their 70s. So that was a really cool, unique experience that I was really happy to be a part of. So finally, I'm gonna talk about some reflection of my project. So one thing that I learned about myself was that Physical therapy, while it's a huge interest of mine, is not necessarily something that I want to pursue in the future. Um, I would love to continue researching and learning about it and hope to take some college classes regarding physical therapy, but I don't think that this is something that I want to do with the rest of my life. Um, some things that I wish I would have done differently was start my community service way earlier. I sort of got caught in the first semester um, with a lot of stuff to balance. I was taking lots of pretty difficult classes. I, it was the heat of college application season. And so the community service along with all those other things was a lot to handle and it was pretty overwhelming. So I wish that I would just have started that earlier and I think it would have made for much better and more impactful projects, but I'm still really happy with what I did. And some advice for future governor school seniors. Use this project as a chance to explore your interests. Like I said, physical therapy was a big interest of mine and I'm really glad that I did this project. Um, you can really do anything. You'll see in just the projects today that there's so many different topics that you can explore. Any interest, any question that you need answered, this is a great time to do that. My second piece of advice is that don't procrastinate. And it sounds really cliche and you'll probably hear it a dozen more times, but just take that as a sign of how important it is. You do not want to get caught with a whole bunch of classes, college applications, and you still have all of this project to handle. It's a whole lot for anybody to handle, so just make sure you start early, start in summer, and you'll be successful all the way through. So now I'm going to talk about my future plans. So I plan on attending the University of Alabama in the fall of this year. I will be majoring in political science and public policy to hopefully go on and get my master's and study in the field of legal analysis. And with that being said, does anybody have any questions? Um, they can be used for anything. So with the broken bones, typically you would use modalities used for muscle education. So this would just help strengthen the area around it. So when you do start to get on your feet more or work with that area of your body more, um, you'll be stronger than you were, you know, if you hadn't used the modalities. Um, so there was nothing in particular. Actually, when I filled out most of my college applications, I applied in most places as a kinesiology major, but I am also in Mr. Pace's AP government class. And so a lot of the things that he talked about were very interesting to me. 
And I sort of talked with my parents about it and I thought that this would be a super interesting field to go into. So I definitely have physical therapy as a backup, which is why I chose the University of Alabama because they have really great programs in both. So if the political science doesn't really sound, work out for me when I get to college, I can always fall back on physical therapy. So it's nothing in particular. Um, so you can use both on most injuries. Um, they do target different things. So heat is usually used for warming up, especially if you're not able to as much. So with an ankle sprain, obviously you cannot run and warm your body up for the activities. Um, whereas cold is more targeted towards inflammation and reducing swelling, things like that. And any other questions? All right. Good morning. Thank you all for coming, judges and the audience. My name is Artel Algigi, and I'll be focusing on diversity. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm actually a little early to this project. Um, some of my peers are in the back there. Um, I'm actually supposed to be taking this project uh, the following year, but I decided to take a path that would put me a year early and graduating early, um, which threw me a few curveballs, such as um, taking classes outside of school online and using some in-school um, ERVGS hours. Um, thanks to uh, Mr. Morrison and Ms. Esch, I was able to um, use my fourth block in going to my internship at UVA and becoming the first junior fellow to work with the diversity department there. So my research question um, was, why does diversity matter in higher education? And thankfully, um, firsthand, I was able to experience why it matters um, through my internship. Um, so I've come to find out that it really uh, matters because it allows for people from all different um, cultures and perspectives to really have a mutual understanding um, of all kinds of different topics. So for my community service, um, I worked with International Neighbors, a nonprofit here in Charlottesville that focuses on working with refugees um, and just settling down in the U.S. in a new home. And so here is a picture from the very first time I volunteered with International Neighbors. Um, this is an Afghan family of nine, and they, after I had delivered food to them, um, they wouldn't let us leave without serving us tea and cookies as an appreciation. And here's some food that I delivered to the refugees. 
Um, although it didn't occur to me um, in the moment, I found out that I had to actually explain some of the foods because they didn't have all the foods back where they were from. And so I remember one instance, um, I had to explain to um, a Ukraine mom and her son how to use ginger paste because they hadn't seen it before, and especially not in a tube where you just squeeze it and you use it. Um, so there would be instances where I just have to explain um, how you'd use it and how you'd cook with it. Here's some more food that I delivered. This one was to the Afghanistan family um, that served us tea and cookies in the last slide. And so for my internship, uh, like I said, I was the first junior fellow at the DEI department at UVA. Um, I worked closely with Joshua Epps, Dr. Kevin McDonald, the vice president for diversity, and Megan Faulkner, the chief of staff. So like I said, I worked very closely with Joshua Epps. Um, he's the manager of Mocha Woka, which is a program um, which stands for Men of Color, Honor, and Ambition and Women of Color, Honor, and Ambition. Um, and so basically, it's really just a university and a community outreach where we'd get um, university students and we'd get uh, middle and high school students and they'd collaborate together so they could really just create this bond um, of higher education and diversity, um, as well as the um, bonding between um, the community outreach. I was also able to help with the Cornell West event. That was a big um, thing during my internship. Cornell West is a social rights activist, um, a Harvard professor for 15 years, and he's written over 20 books. And he, I was uh, thankful to listen in on the event and help out. And on the far side is um, a meeting that I listened into during first block here in school and I joined via Zoom. It was one of their staff meetings and so it was just a routine staff meeting where they told us a little bit about what was going on in the department or any new updates. So a little bit of what I learned about myself is that I really, really, really love to work with people. Um, I always loved working with people, but no matter how big, no matter how small the impact, um, this was really just an eye-opening experience um, that gave me a whole new light of perspective. And so here are a few pictures of my community service. Um, and I, along the way, I really gained so much knowledge and so many inspirational stories from the refugees that I will forever have them in my heart. So my advice for incoming seniors is to really like Jackson said, do something that you love so it's not just another project for you to just check off on the books or for you just to get this Blue Ridge Capstone project over with. I mean, you could do that, but at the end of the day, what are you going to gain from it? Nothing. So really do something that is an experience to you and that you'll gain, gain a lifetime of experience from. My future plans are to go to JMU and major in business and minor in humanities so I can continue on with this project that I started here at Blue Ridge as a career. Any questions? Yes? Yeah, so actually that's a really good question. So most of the time it would be families and actually the kids would be the one uh, translating between their parents and me. Um, and if there was cases where that wasn't an option, we'd use Google Translate and hand signals. And I mean, they always knew um, that I was coming to deliver food, so it wasn't a surprise. Um, but yeah, it was actually the kids most of the time that would interpret everything. Any other questions? Yeah, no, actually, I talked to Josh Webbs about that, um, and I'm still, my internship hasn't stopped, so we're actually, that's our next step um, when I'm working with him. Yeah. Any other questions? All right.
a shot. <laughs> All right, uh, yeah. next up we got uh, this young man is real hard. This is a really cool project. I really uh, it's my man, John Smith. Come on up here. You're talking about technical and I'll talk All right. Ooh, that's nice. All right. So for my senior capstone project, I'm John Smeds, and I did it on photography, so a little bit, oh, a little bit about me is obviously I'm a senior here at Fluvanna County High School. I enjoy weightlifting and digital art, and so I do a lot in Blender and Photoshop, and I'm looking to be a 3D animator for animated films, uh, such as like cars, that type of thing. Um, so why I chose photography um, for my senior project is I've always had a fascination with cameras and kind of how they work. So this right here, this doesn't have a laser pointer. I'm in the projector. But this was actually the first SLR camera I got, which stands for single lens reflex camera. And basically just think of the fancy camera that photographers use. And so that was actually a film camera. I actually never used that, by the way. <laughs> Horrible financial decision. But it kind of symbolizes the start of my journey because I got that in middle school and kind of my beginning of my fascination with cameras as a whole. So my research question explored how cameras have evolved over time and the cultural impacts of the camera overall. And focusing on the cultural impacts, I found the most prominent example of how cameras have impacted history is through public opinion. And that can mo most notably be seen uh, through the Dust Bowl. So here are a few pictures from the Dust Bowl. And photographers basically would photograph uh, refugees migrating away from their homes in order to build public support for governmental programs, such as the FSA, which is the Farmer, Farmer, Security, Administ yeah, Farmer Security Administration. And they would basically use these photos, such as, not that one, this one, of their camps that they actually ran. So this is a picture of a family leaving their home from the Dust Bowl, and this is an FSA-run camp, and they're pumping water out of a well. And it basically, the government actually hired photographers to kind of build support for their program, build support for FDR, and it just kind of highlights the effects that photography can have on public opinion and society as a whole. And then more on the evolution side of how the camera has evolved over time, the most interesting part that I found of camera evolution was the very first part. So this was actually 400 BC, and this is more of a concept than an invention. But this is called the camera obscura. And how it worked is you have this dark room completely cut off by light. And you'd cut a small hole on one side of the wall, and it would actually project light uh, onto the opposing wall. And it would project a picture that is flipped and inverted. And painters would use this to kind of make their art more detailed. And I think the coolest thing that I found personally about this is its relevance to modern photography. So actually, the most notable examples of this would be the size of the hole and how it affects the clarity of the picture. Um, so for example, this is a modern picture that I took of wheat. I actually don't know if it's wheat. I'm calling it wheat. That's wheat. And you can see it's kind of sharp. And this was shot with a super uh, small aperture. And that made it more clear. So as you can see, it's more clear. And just like going back one slide, with this, the smaller the hole would be, the more clear the picture would be. That's a sharp one. This is a wider aperture of the same uh, wheat. And as you can see, it's more blurry and more blurred out. And that just kind of shows how even elements from the very first 
process of camera evolution are prevalent in modern day photography and itself. And then another big step of the evolution was dry plate photography. So this was the first kind of photography that allowed photographers to travel away from their studio. And it utilized these glass plates covered in a gel emulsion, which was sensitive to light. So you would expose that to light and then you could put it away for however long you needed to put it away for, take it back to the studio, develop it, and you'd have your picture. And so this right here, this camera, is actually a wet plate camera, not a dry plate camera, but it's actually at UVA. And it's what they used for a project where they documented portraits of African Americans in the 20th century. And the difference between the wet plate and the dry plate is the wet plate used a solution as opposed to a dry gel emulsive layer. And moving past that onto my internship, I interned with a local photographer, Ali Johnson, from Ali Johnson Photography. And I basically would witness her senior portrait sessions with other high school seniors. And what was really cool about that is I got to notice how she interacted with her clients. And I found the most important thing whenever photographing anyone subjectly and in a situation like photography where a lot of people are very iffy about how they look in certain photos was to make your client feel comfortable. So she'd do this through making jokes, through asking about their personal life, there's anything to set them at ease, which would give them a better experience. And it would create a more authentic photo in the end. And she also took my senior portraits and walked me through. Those are my senior portraits. I'm looking very handsome. Um, and she walked me through her editing process behind this. And so she would lighten up the eyes a little bit. As you can see, there's virtually no acne on my face. She removed all that in post. And then she also whitened my teeth a little bit in the smiling one. And to just kind of highlight this more, at her editing process, I actually took my own photo, horrible photo. Um, I'm looking very goofy, but you can see I got a double chin going on there. I got some acne. And then I went in and edited this. And this is an extreme example, not something she would actually go through. But as you can see, the double chin has been removed and my acne has been cleared. And that just kind of shows her process. And her goal was not to change how they looked, but just kind of portray how they looked if they had got, gotten like a full eight hours of sleep, um, had been on top of their skincare routine, unlike I am, and just kind of show them at their best and what they could be looking like if they had taken extra care. And then moving past that onto my community service. So I did it with the FSPCA and worked with the shelter manager, Jesse Payne. And what I would do is I would go in take animals out of their cage and into the field. And I would take their picture, go home, edit the picture, and then send it back to her. She'd post them on the website. And so that would help advertisement um, and help them get adopted. And I did receive multiple compliments about the quality of my pictures, which I'm inflating my own ego here. But it was just something notable that she uh, mentioned to me that I found really awesome. It was Heartwarming. So here are a few pictures that I took. So this one is of Quirk. Um, this one is of Cheeto. And one of the big problems I faced with this whole photographing animals thing was I had to use all natural light, meaning I couldn't use any photography lights or artificial light as I didn't know if the animals uh, would react in a negative way, whether to make them nervous or aggressive. Uh, so I had to use all natural light and this made me even more reliant on the editing process of these photos. Um, so as you can see, I know it's hard to tell, but that's not a good picture. And that's straight out of the camera. And as you can see, the dog's completely dark. You can't even see him. You can see a little bit of the sky there, but not much. And so these were the pictures I kind of had to deal with and had to bring back through editing and modern software. So this was it after the editing. So as you can see, I brightened back up the dog made him back the focus of the subject, and uh, just made him pop off the background a little bit. So here's another example, Quirk. This time you can at least tell it's a dog, which was already an improvement. But with the editing, I kind of separated him from the background. I made him pop off the screen a little bit more. And this final one, again, this is a better picture, but his, particularly his backside is kind of blending into the background, which is something you don't want. You want them separated so the focus is on them. And especially with adoption, you want more of the animal visible because they don't care about the cage in the back. 
So this was after it. As you can see, he's popped off the screen, and he's looking pretty handsome. And so my advice for future seniors is this is a picture of Milo, who is a Greek wrestler. And the story of Milo basically goes, for four years, he would run a mile with the cow on his back, and he kind of shows the beauty of progressive overload. And I know very, like, almost all of us are going to say something with procrastination as being their advice to future ones, don't procrastinate. Uh, but I want to take it a step past that and say, if you're going to procrastinate, uh, do it on something, do it, spend your time doing something that's meaningful to you and not something like scrolling on uh, YouTube and being lazy sitting on a couch, which I've never done. And then my future plans, as I plan to study computer science uh, at Regents University, I'm not solely, like I'm not 100% set on this university or even that set like the computer science major, but that's my plan as of now. It could change. Uh, any questions? Aiden. I think there's both positive and negative impacts. I think one of the negative impacts is obviously, you can see in the fitness industry, body positivity, that type of thing. You can very easily Photoshop your photos to make you look a lot better than you are, as you saw with my picture there even. Um, but it's also positive because you can see what's going on in other parts of the world. So I think there's both, depends on how you look at it. And I think that it's, it's not right to justify something based on solely its negative consequences. So I think if I had to choose one, it'd be positive. Jackson. Mm -hmm. I, I did try to research that a little bit. And there's not too much, because now with editing and all that, it's, it's very easy to fake stuff now. So. People are a lot less reliant on photos. So I kind of did more research onto the historical portion where, especially during the Dust Bowl, no one was photoshopping their uh, images. So, yes. I do not do any film, I do all digital. I am not skilled enough for that or have the patience. Yes. I did a little bit, and I think, I guess the biggest thing that she was kind of saying with that is not as much how cameras have changed over time, but how the use of photos have. So she mentioned how uh, she really kind of misses how people printed out and put up photos in their homes, which does not happen anywhere near as much since you have it all on your phone um, scrolling through. So not as much uh, camera. I think she thinks that's overall a good thing. But yeah. Yes. Right. Um, I think... For each edit, like for each dog, I took probably probably about like 100 photos for each dog. But those photos, probably 90 of them were out of focus because in my infinite genius, I decided to use a manual lens, which didn't have autofocus. Um, but in terms of actual editing, it's not super hard. It's just dragging sliders back and forth and maybe a little bit of painting. So not super hard to teach them. And I'd say like per photo, maybe like 10 minutes for each one. Yes. Oh my gosh, yes. I, one animal in particular, I think it was actually Bones, so one of the ones that was on there, that was probably like an hour to get him look in the right direction. But I did figure out, I made the weirdest noises to make them try to like look at me like, but yeah, it, it was a pain. 
Aiden again. Yes, we, I used Lightroom for most of those photos. I think I actually used Photoshop for the one of like me, but Lightroom for most of it, and yes, we do use that at the high school. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Gracie Clifton and I did my project on the elderly in EMS. So a little bit about myself, I work as a dietary aide at Our Lady of Peace Assistant Living Facility. I'm also a nationally registered EMT and volunteer at both Louisa and Fluvanna County Rescue Squads. So on this call, we had a geriatric patient from a skilled nursing facility whose blood sugar had dropped to low critical levels. So I was in charge of airway. I inserted a NPA, which is a nasal pharyngeal airway into the nose and ventilated this patient with a BVM, a bag valve mask, because they were not breathing adequately enough to sustain life. While I did that, the paramedic established an IV and administered a dextro solution, which is a simple sugar solution to bring his blood sugar up. So in my experience, both at Our Lady of Peace and on the rescue squad, I deal a lot with the geriatric population. I decided to combine the two to learn how I can better care for this population. 
My internship was at Our Lady of Peace Assistant Living Facility under Sherry Beveridge, who's the activities coordinator there. So I served a total of 14 hours over the summer, shadowing her and learning how to plan activities at the facility. One of the first things I did was go on a nature walk with the residents. So this is a great way to keep them active and mobile and get outdoors for some fresh air. We also had great conversations throughout our walk. The second thing I did was plan and organize an ice cream social. So I was responsible for gathering all my materials and setting up the room and inviting the residents down to enjoy some ice cream. So this is a great way for them to be social and have something to look forward to throughout the day. Another thing I helped with was a resident showcase. So this is kind of like a show and tell. The residents got to display some of their accomplishments throughout the years. So I was responsible for interviewing them and creating their write-ups and their displays. We then set this up in the lobby and residents and guests could come throughout the day and view what they have accomplished. So I know during COVID when I would deliver food to their rooms, a lot of residents would lay in bed all day. They wouldn't get dressed because all activities were canceled. So this was a time of complete isolation for them. So activities really help to improve both mental and physical abilities and gives them something to look forward to throughout the day and some motivation to get up. For my community service, I serve at Fluvanna County Rescue Squad. From August to November, I did over 300 hours of community service. And since then, it's doubled as I continue to volunteer there and Louisa whenever I have any free time. My mentor was Scott Grant, nationally registered paramedic and EMS educator. For the impact of my community service, I attended a career fair at Hermitage High School in Richmond. Along with Wendy, we set up this display for DRT, Delta Response Team. And a little bit about the career fair, it's kind of a competition to see who can have the most elaborate display and attract the most students. So as you see back there, we have an airway mannequin that we intubated and attached the bag valve mask. So students were able to come up and squeeze the bag and see what it's like to ventilate a patient. We did have to get creative though because it's just a mannequin head. So I created the body out of isolation gowns. We then attached a cardiac generator to the monitor so we could display different rhythms. This is the flyer we handed out for Delta Response Team. It also created, it also had a roadmap to becoming an EMS provider. And so this was a great opportunity for me to share my passion for EMS with students, sixth grade through 12th grade. And they had amazing questions about what it's like to be an EMT and what it's like in EMS. In this display over here, a shadow box that was created by Scott we had some tools and things people use to get high, and some of it is very surprising, like school glue or turnip greens. And below that, we had a taxidermy spider, which was a great attention grabber, because people would come up and say, I heard about this spider, I had to come see for myself, and we related that to the environmental portion of the EMT course. This shadow box contains some of the drugs we use on the ambulance, and so it was great to talk to the students about when we might administer them. My research question was how to better collaborate resources to decrease the need for EMS activation in the elderly. So it's important to note that over a quarter of all emergency department volumes consist of the geriatric population. And by the year 2030, nearly half of all EMS calls will be geriatric patients. And so in my research, I found the answer to this is community paramedicine. So community paramedics can come out to patients' homes and treat them for chronic illnesses or lower acuity illnesses instead of activating that 911 response when maybe that's not necessary. So it gives them alternative, alternative destinations and alternative treatments instead of relying on that 911 service when maybe it's more complex than necessary. Also in my expert interview with Scott Grant, I was able to determine that we need to have a more proactive instead of reactive approach in our EMS response. For example, if somebody calls 911 four times a week because they've fallen, a reactive approach would be to help them up and leave. 
However, we need to be more proactive by finding out why they have fallen and fix that to prevent them from falling again in the future. And much like the fire department, when they come out and install smoke detectors into people's homes, we can do fall risk assessments, meaning we identify things like tripping hazards, maybe slippery rugs, bad lighting, or maybe help install guardrails. And this helps to prevent um, falls and decrease the need for our EMS activation. So I plan to attend PVCC this fall and get my associate's degree in applied science and my paramedic certification. If I could do anything differently in this project, it would be to explore more internship options and maybe venture out. My advice for our future BRVGS students is to do your project on something you're passionate about and maybe something that relates to your future career. Because before this, I didn't realize being an EMT is something that I would love and I didn't know I wanted to be a paramedic. But through my community service, I was able to identify that. I also made a lot of great connections with people who work for DRT and I now work for DRT. So making those connections throughout your project is super important. And I've met a lot of amazing people there that have had such a positive influence on me personally and my EMS experience. So thank you. And are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. So we could do that on the rescue squad, but it is hard when you're answering calls actively. But I know a lot of calls we get for falls, we do take a lot of time to talk to the patients and kind of figure out what made them fall and maybe make suggestions when we do respond to those calls. And there's also ways in the community that we can have those programs set up to do that as well. Yes, ma'am. So I passed my nationally registry, my national registry test in May of last year, but I hadn't started volunteering until around August. Yes, ma'am. It's um, so it was really tricky with school because I also played field hockey in the fall. But after that, and maybe I would just come by, and I was able to you know learn from my mentor Scott Grant, and even now on the weekends or just any time I have, really. Oh, thank Um, I went to this, uh, I haven't gone to a school board one yet. That's okay. first I'm going to tonight, but I did the board of supervisors. So it was like two, three hours. So, but it is work week or like the budget period. So, yeah, yeah. A lot of physical things. Yeah. Random one? Out. Stepped out. Sorry. I know she's supposed to be the one I look at. Mm -mm. There she goes. Okay, we should close the door, so that might be it for everybody coming in. This will be good. This is small. Yeah. Yeah. Are we getting ready? Uh, got the PowerPoint. I got Haley. Got Echo here. Okay. Okay.
So uh, let's uh, get to our next speaker. Uh, again, uh, like all these guys, uh, uh, we're students in the Bartle Lips uh, Plantation. Uh, coming to me with some things that we can do at this class. Um, uh, she's doing her project on uh, humanities and healthcare. Humanities and healthcare. Uh, please welcome to the stage, Ms. Kaylee Carter. Come on, <laughs> Good morning. Hello, hello. Good. Okay. Um, my name is Haley Carter, and I did my project for my senior capstone Blue Ridge project on the humanities and healthcare and how a patient interacts with a provider and vice versa can really influence both parties. So this is my quality quote. It was written by Maya Angelou, and she is a world-renowned poet and writer during the civil rights era. And she spoke this quote more to civil rights and how people interacted with each other, but I thought that it tied very well to my healthcare theme. So it says, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And I feel that this is very true because even not considering the world of healthcare, this is very true because your actions speak more than your words do. And it's how you conduct yourself and how you carry yourself that people really get to know you. Okay, so a little fun fact, my internship was at the Fluvanna Health Clinic with Amy Byer, who's seen in the middle of this picture, and she actually has that quote on a canvas hanging in one of her patient contact rooms, and I would picked this quote prior to starting my internship over the summer, but I thought that it was really cool how they had lined like that because I didn't know that, that canvas was in there. Um, but I did my internship with Amy Byer, and she's a certified family nurse practitioner, and so at her clinic, um, since it is a local and more community-based clinic and it's a small setting, she only has three rooms and she sees around 30 to 40 patients every day uh, in 30 minute increments. But while I was there, there's a lot of HIPAA violations, or not violations, but HIPAA qualifications that had to be met. And so there's a form that I had to sign saying that anything that I saw or did there was not allowed to be taken outside of the office, which is similar in any field that you see in healthcare. But while I was there, I was doing a lot of trans patient transfers. She had a lot of new patients since that her clinic has only been open to four to five years now. And while I was there, since I'm a certified national EMT, I also got to have a lot more hands-on experience than other people that have interned for her in the past from Fluvanna County High School. I got to do vitals. I got to talk to patients and get their history and their family history. And I got to actually document some of the reports in the last couple of my days for my internship of those things that I experienced through her EPIC system, which is the system that she keeps for patient documentation, and then the patients can see those reports and their vitals online through that system. Um, and this leads into my research. My research question was, how does a medical professional's tone and approach affect the patient's willingness to express their concerns? And so I really wanted to dive deep. Now, I want to be a nurse, for my future, and but I'm also currently certified as an EMT. And so through the, uh, through the experiences that I already have being an EMT and knowing where I wanna take my future steps, I wanted to know the psychology and the humanities behind healthcare. And it's knowing that it's not just a patient is their conditions, knowing that a patient is a lot more, they have history, and they have things that have affected them in their past. And so the way that they, you talk to a patient and the way that a provider approaches certain subjects with a patient can really impact not only how the patient sees that provider and if they want to continue seeking out care with them, but also how that patient will view healthcare as a whole. Now, in my internship with Amy, I got to see and experience a lot of patients that do not have a primary care provider. Now this means that they only go to the doctor when they are in excruciating pain, when they need to seek out medication for say they have a lot of pain in their knee, they work a blue collar job, they've fallen down a lot in the, in the line and they're experiencing excruciating pain in their knee. Now they need medication to reduce the inflammation and they need to seek out treatment now. Well, if they, go, if they have a primary care provider that they regularly see, maybe annually even, they can talk to that provider. But if they don't, then they need to seek out 
maybe 911 at the worst, or even a dock in the box in Charlottesville. While at my internship with Amy, I got to talk to a bunch of patients that have these common, uh, in a rural area, you see this issue arise a lot more than in urban area. Um, and through my research, that lines up directly with my internship and it's seen in parallel worlds. And so also through my, or my research, I got to see how a rapport built and communication from the patient to the provider and also from the provider to the patient can make the patient feel a lot more comfortable. And anything that you can do to make the patient feel comfortable is gonna be positive for both the patient and the provider because someone goes to the, patient goes to the provider and says, I've been experiencing chest pain. But since they think that chest pain is the most important issue, that's the only thing that they lead on to. They don't also tell them that they have a history of diabetes in their family and they also are experiencing symptoms of diabetes. And so now they're starting to lose feeling in their foot a little bit because those neurons are not being as connected as they should be. Uh, for my community service, I am a group of six people, one junior and five seniors, including myself, and we coordinate and plan a line of blood drives. Now I've had three blood drives that we've been a part of so far this year, and the program used to be held by Ms. Wanda Elliott in the back right there. Uh, when she transferred to Blue Ridge to be the head of Blue Ridge, the program was kind of in a weird stall. Are we gonna continue doing this year or is it gonna kind of stop? And so we decided with Sharon Payne as our mentor that we were gonna pick up the program and we were gonna continue hosting these blood drives at Fluvanna County High School and in the surrounding area, including Lake Monticello Fire Department and the Pamira Fire Department. And with this group, some of us seen here, uh, this was the first blood drive that we hosted this year. This is in our um, second hand gem down the, down the corridor here. Um, in these three blood drives that we've hosted this year, we have collected 102 units. Now per each unit, there's three people helped with these blood donations. And so in these three drives alone, we have collected 306 people that we have helped and this blood has donated towards. Now, I wouldn't be doing my job as trying to plan these blood drives and promote people to come donate if I didn't try to plug. And so for everybody in the room, we have a blood drive on the 26th coming up at the end of this month that Gracie Clifton is going to be leading, heading up for us. And then my blood drive that I was rescheduled is next month on the 19th. Now, I say rescheduled, why was it rescheduled? What happened? Well, as a part of Blue Ridge and the, any sort of program, there's some issues that can arise with any program that's trying to be brought up and reintroduced. And so I was supposed to have a blood drive in December. Well, we got here. Been working weeks and weeks to put this blood drive together. I've got all the people signed up. There's people coming in the door. We've got some internet issues. The server is not connecting all the way through since it is a, people have submitted their info to us. It has to be HIPAA protected and they have to use their type of server so that no, nobody's information, including their blood type, their address, their social security is willing to be seen except for the people that need to see it. And since that server was denied, we could not host the blood drive here. But we rescheduled people, we got them in to donate at the Rye, or East Ravana Firehouse. There was another blood drive that going on there a week later. So we kind of piggybacked onto that one and we got our people in there. And I got another one for April set up, which is coming up soon. Um, through my community service, oh, real quick. This was a shirt that I had designed with our group for the December one. On, on the front for a little Christmas treat, we did like an ornament with a heart that has blood going through it. And it's like the little, little Grinch scene, it's really cute. And then on the back, it says, don't be a Grinch, it's only a pinch. FCHS blood drive, December, 2022. And similar to these shirts that Jay had designed for our first blood drive. Um, through my community service, not only was I able to help these 306 people that we've already helped and the ones that we plan to help in our next five drives that we have through the end of the year, but I also got to see how important it is for that communication barrier that can be seen from people that are trying to plan blood drives, but also trying to get outreach in the community. It is very difficult 
to try and bring people into a space like this and to feel open and safe and protected while donating blood in these chairs. And there's very few people that are willing to start something like this, but the people that have donated in the past are very willing and they know how important it is to donate blood for other people in need. For my future plans, I'm gonna be attending the University of Alabama with Emily Jackson. And I'm going to be a, I'm gonna be in their Capstone College of Nursing. This is me in front of the college. Um, my plans are to be a travel nurse for a few years. I'm going to be, or hope to be, in the ICU floor nurse for pediatrics. And then after I have a couple years of experience and hopefully my travel, I want to go back to school and get my master's in pediatrics nurse practitioner. Um, something I would do definitely, differently about this project is I loved how I started my internship over the summer and I had my hours done before we even started school. And I would really advise that for upcoming seniors to do that also, because once you're a senior, all the college applications, it's a very busy first semester. And if you're as ambitious as everybody is in Blue Ridge, everybody's taking APs, all those dual enrollment courses, it's a lot to handle all at once. And so what I would do differently though, is I would really try and nail down my community service over the summer, at least a plan and a concentration as to what exactly this is what I'm gonna do and not kind of be like, oh, well, I did my internship, so I'm already ahead because those dates, every day ticks by real fast. And you think, well, I've got like three months to figure it out. That three months is gonna hit and you're gonna be like, okay, we gotta figure out what we're doing now. Um, some advice I would give to upcoming seniors would be, to not be afraid to fail like I did with the first blood drive because I saw what an issue would be and then we got back on the no block list with the high school so our server is not denied anymore with the American Red Cross. But failure is not a bad thing and it's something that you can learn from and develop. And then also another piece is that you're not defined by your grades. Your grades don't make up who you are. And just because you got a C or a B in this calc class when you were really wanting to get a better grade doesn't mean that like 10 years down the road, nobody's gonna really care what grade you got in your calc class your senior year. So focus on who you are as a person and if you love who you are every single day. Um, but yeah, are there any questions? Thank you. Yes, all the blood drives that we have hosted here have been community drives. And so that's really the main, like it's very easy to try and get students here, even though if you're under 16, or you have to be 16 with parent permission, but if you're 18, you don't have to have parent permission. But it's very hard to really get that advertisement out to the community to let people know that we're hosting a blood drive, we'd love for you to come. Uh, we take walk-ins, but we have a sign up online. And so it's, we try to post every single week a new link to that. Yes. It is on my website also, if you wanted to go to my website. Yes. Um, what, what? Um, I've always really loved kids. Um, I help, I'm a, a co-planner for the nursery at my church. And almost every Sunday I'm there with the kids and really helping them and everything. Um, and I also part-time nanny over the summer. And so I've always thought that uh, just kids are so lovable and they really like, they're just like sponges. They're so into anything and everything that you say. Um, I've always really like, once I nailed down, like I wanna be a nurse and I see you floor nurse, I was kind of like a toss up between neonatal and pediatrics. But I think with peds, I would see a more wide range of cases. Yeah, thank you. Anything else?
sky's the limit. As long as it's just for the, the recording, so right? Where they go. Hello, I'm Sky Moore, and I'm doing sonography for my project. So, I sonography kept coming up a lot in my life. I kept hearing it, and when I did career aptitude tests, it was always something that just kept popping. And I always wanted to help people, so I figured, why not try this? This might work for a project. So over the summer, I was thinking over and over again, maybe, maybe, maybe. And it was really my dad who finally pushed me to say, hey, there's this really nice lady at Zion's Primary and Specialty Care, and she'll be so nice to you. You should totally try to go and intern with her. I'm like, okay, that might work. So a little bit about me. That's me in third grade going to the daddy-daughter dance with my grandpa. He is a lovely, lovely man, and you can laugh at the picture. It's horrible. Um, he was so nice to me, and he always inspired me to want to do what I love. And part of my grandpa's story is that he has had three heart attacks in his life, four major heart events. And so the heart has always been something I want to help with. I want to be able to help people like I want to help my granddad. So when I finally uh, chose to do sonography, I wanted to focus on the heart. Echocardiography just found me right after that. So I did my internship, like I said before, at the Zion Specialty in Primary Care at, uh, sorry, at the UVA Zion's, UVA Zion's Primary and Specialty Care with Lisa Mazingo over here. And she was super nice to me the entire time. She helped me understand all the capabilities of sonography and how it can help people and how this is a very usable technology. It can be applied in so many different ways. It can help with therapeutics. It can help with animals. It is so important to know about this. And this is actually a funny story. So right when I was going into this internship, I was so nervous. I had been stressing about it all week. And I'm led to this back room. And I'm added in, led to this, led to this back room. And I walk in. It was really quiet, and she's like, oh, look at this screen. Look at what the heart's doing right here. And looking at this, I just fell in love with the entire idea of doing this. This is what I wanted to do. This is my dream right here, is looking at this heart and seeing that's where the problem is. That's where I can help identify problems. So when I got to into the internship, she helped me identify all the different parts of the heart. She helped me understand how this is a usable technology, how this is applicable. So then I wanted to learn more. Um, this is the area where I was at. I was always right here, right next to the machine where she worked at. This is the echocardiography machine. The patient would lie right here. So I wanted to learn more and more and more. So through my research, I started studying how the machine worked. 
how they produce sound waves that went through the skin um, into the organ and bounced back. It was like music almost. Um, it was just sound waves bouncing back and forth. It was so interesting to me. I was so attached to everything I did. And so when I uh, got further into my internship, I started learning about the different viewings. This one is where she's taking a measurement of the ve left ventricle when it's uh, fully dilated and when it's also contracted. She'll uh, take measurements of the blood flow and calculate how efficient the heart's being right there. And then this one, if you ever uh, make a sandwich, it's really odd, but if you ever make a sandwich and you cross it, uh, cut it down the middle, that's a cross section of the heart. So you can see the um, valve going back and forth right here. You can see the atrium right there and all the layers of the heart tissue. And it can also help identify if there's a problem, like if there's a tear up here. And seeing this, it's a way to identify there's something wrong visually. And I'm a visual learner, so that was just insanely helpful. Uh, this one is another viewing she had. It's where you can see the blood moving through the different valves. You can help visual see if there's a leak, a leak somewhere or if it's not going where it should be. So the red blood, as you see pushed through, that's the one, that's the blood that's close to the transducer, little stick. And the blue blood, that's the blood moving further away from the transducer. So you can evaluate how fast it's moving, where it's going, and just everything you need to know about the blood just from one image. And then this one is not so great for the patient for this one. This is a major leak from the aortic valve right here going through the middle. And it goes all the way back into the left ventricle. And seeing this, this is not exactly what my grandfather suffered, but it's a problem. And there is a clear defined image of that problem. So when you're in the hospital and you hear that someone had a heart attack, you don't see what's wrong. It's all on the inside. So you're just sitting in your room, you're scared. You're like, what is going on? They look fine on the outside. I don't see a cut or anything. Why, why is there a problem? And then it's right here. And then this one is a stent right in the back. So a stent is placed into a valve to extend, like to extend the artery and help blood flow through faster. And my grandfather actually had three of these placed in after his heart attacks because he had a lot of blockages. And this person had the same thing. And it was another thing I could relate back to. This is why I want to do this. This is another way I can identify problems. So when I got to my research, I'm like, I decided that I want to focus on how we got to this point where we can see the problem and fully diagnose what's going on. So this is just a worded out way of my question. And I found through my research that our idea of looking inside the human body has been so, has been an old idea. It's been used for so long. And this technology has been applied to like sonar so we can see ships in the ocean. It's been applied to radar and airplanes. It's everywhere. And if you keep going through it, you just find more and more uses. It's such a usable technology. I was amazed by it. Um, and for my community service, I wanted to focus back on my grandfather. I wanted to help people with heart problems because that's been a trial in my family. There's a lot of heart disease. There's a lot of problems everywhere. Um, and so I decided I wanted to do a fundraiser for the American Heart Association. And I managed to raise $45. Now, it was not a huge amount. It was not all that I aspired it to be, but I was proud of what I was able to bring. And these are a bigger picture of the flyers that are around the containers. And I set those up, oops, sorry. I set those up around the school and I had two here at the Favannah County High School. Ms. Bruce was kind enough to let me have them here and I managed to get some donations. So I managed to do some good. Um, I aspire to be a sonographer in the future. I want to do this. This is my dream I want to do. So hopefully I can go in undergrad at UVA. If not, I'll just transfer over from PVCC, get certified. I want to work for this. This is my dream. Um, advice? Don't procrastinate. It is horrible. Don't do it. It is so stressful. Um, if I had to do this again, I would definitely have done my internship during the summer because it would have been so much easier so much better schedule wise, it was a mess when I was doing it. Um, I would have had an idea of my community service a lot sooner. I had an idea, but I never really stuck to it. And it was really hard to f fully pin down what I wanted to do. It was really hard. And other than that, there's not much else. Any questions?
Yes. Um, I'm very interested in echocardiography. That is working on the heart. That is taking images of the heart. That is what I did, uh, what I helped with with my internship. So that's what I want to go into. I, I hope to be one of the, an echocardiographer someday. Anyone else? Yes. Um, I got to a point where I can figure out ex somewhat what was happening. I was not as nearly as good as my mentor, but I could figure out the different shapes, what was efficient, what was not. If there was a major problem, like you saw in the leak one, you could visually see that leak was just a big problem. It was not going to be great. Um, she was able to point out the more uh, in-depth details, like we had a patient that had a replacement uh, aortic valve, and she was able to see that with the monitor. I could not tell the difference, but it was really cool to see. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of time and a lot of practice. I got better towards the end of my internship, but not nearly as good as the professor. Thank you. Yes. Uh, can you say that again? A lot of it had to do with uh, diabetics and having blockages. There was a, that was a very similar problem. She had a lot of people that were diabetic coming in there. Um, mostly just people prone to heart attacks and strokes and had heart disease in their family. That was the patients I saw when I was there. Okay. Anyone else? This is on. Um, my name is uh, Anthony Mundy, and um, I did my project on uh, local history and figures, more specifically uh, John Har Hartwell Cock II, uh, his family, uh, friends, and associates. Um, so I picked history because it's always been something I've been very interested in. Uh, history class has always taken me um, ever since I think it was the 1920s, the sort of 1950s era, um, Great Depression. Uh, the New Deal with uh, FDR and World War II, it's always sort of uh, taken me, uh, and I've been interested in it more. Uh, U.S. history, uh, Europe history, uh, history all over. Um, I'm, I like U.S. history more, but I, European history is also very interesting to me. Um, and so for my, in, uh, my internship and research, I wanted to do something related with history, and I started 
uh, by learning about uh, this guy right here, uh, John Harbacock II. He's uh, he's a pretty he was in the local area, um, 1800s. Uh, he was a general in the War of 1812. Um, he helped uh, uh, he helped build UVA, and he was on the first board of visitors. Um, and he he built the uh, the local the old courthouse as well as the old stone uh, stone jail. Uh, and so. For my research question, um, I sort of went back and forth, but I always knew that I wanted to do something more local, um, something with John Harwacock, because um, I learned about him, and my internship definitely helped me learn more about him. But in the end, I ended up on how he advanced architecture in Virginia, uh, women's role in politics in Virginia, and the treatment of slaves in Virginia. Um, he attempted to do this. Uh, it was not very successful, unfortunately, but um, for my internship, I worked under Miss Patricia Johnson at the Fluvanna Historical Society. She's the director there. And um, I got extremely lucky with this. Uh, a little bit before I started, she had come into uh, possession of letters by um, these two old, uh, this old couple. Uh, they had two, three or four boxes just full of these old letters uh, pertaining to John Harwacock uh, and his family, uh, to, from him, uh, and just to his family. And, mm, well, the main majority of mine was dealing with letters from Lucy, which is a sort of subsection that we had, uh, to Lucy Harwacock, which was one of his daughters. Um, and they're from her friends. Um, there was uh, one or two from him. There was one or two to him uh, that I got to see. and. It, they were very interesting. Um, first of all, to see just how similar these people are to us. Like, uh, I think probably about 90% of these, uh, we, um, in our little document, we just wrote gossip because it's just gossip. They're talking about going to balls, just about men that they like. It's, it was a bunch of, uh, nonsense. And like, it, it was, it, it's just so similar to how people talk today. Um, just a, in written form. And, uh, one of the, big problems is this. This is kind of hard to tell, but this is the header right here. Um, and then you have all the lines here. This is called cross writing. And they would pretty much run out of paper. So they would write their letter um, through like normal. And then they'd end it off by writing upwards like this. And this is a big pain to deal with. Um, it was just very interesting to see. I'd never encountered this before. Um, and it made this already extremely hard cursive uh, harder to read. But we'd pretty much, we'd uh, read these letters and we'd find the date that they were sent um, and receive, uh, the date that they were sent, the where they were sent to, uh, who they were sent to, who they were sent from, and then we'd get information. We were looking for stuff like illness, travel, uh, politics, uh, that was a big thing. Uh, anything to do with slavery was huge. Um, and, for my community service, uh, I worked under um, Gary Selleck. He's the editorial assistant at uh, Papers for Thomas Jefferson, the retirement series. Uh, he's written a, a numerous amounts of papers, uh, many on uh, slavery. Uh, he wrote one on the, the Revolutionary War and the British emancipation of slaves and using them in their army, which was pretty unheard of at the time. Uh, and I, I pretty much, I, I was taking these, I would take these letters and I would put them into this Google Sheet um, of like, around 500 letters. Um, and I would document all the necessary info that we got and anything interesting. Um, some letters of note uh, that one of the people, I believe it was uh, Courtney, a friend of uh, Lucy Cock, she met Blackhawk, um, who was a, um, an Indian leader and also a uh, major enemy of the US in uh, the War of 1812, um, fighting for the French. Um, and we, somebody just met him, like going down a river. Um, this was incredible to see because it's like this just like completely boring letter, like gossip, like what she's going to buy for dinner, uh, like just, you know, saying that she misses her. And then all of a sudden we see this huge like historical figure. And it's the same with uh, um, they met. Uh, there was quite a few um, ones about meeting just these Indian leaders. And then Andrew Jackson, um, the uh, the president, we there was quite a few letters, because um, this was around his second election, I think around 1820 through 40 uh, were, were these letters. And 
uh, it was talking about his presidency and how they really didn't like him, um, which was very interesting because Andrew Jackson was a very, either people loved him or they hated him, and uh, Courtney did not like him, as a matter of fact. Um, and then slavery. There was a lot of things on slavery, which was uh, really the main thing that we were looking for, um, where we were looking to uh, really just get anything about slavery that we could, um, because John Howard Cock, a big thing about him was his treatment of slaves. Um, he was part of the colonization society. He worked to take these slaves and send them to Ethiopia um, to sort of liberate them. Um, and this is pretty big because there are a series of letters from a Peyton Skipwith, who was a slave that was freed by John Howard Cock. Um, these letters are called, uh, I believe, uh, Letters to Master, um, and they pretty much detail his life with his family. Um, those were that, that he was allowed to take with him. Um, and really, his he didn't like it there, and he wanted to come back. Um, and in these letters, we were looking for stuff like that, um, something that we could publish. Um, and uh, as you'll see here, um, we were looking to pretty much take these and sort of give them, give them out to uh, articles and books that were looking for stuff like what we were finding here for slavery and stuff, and we wanted to give it to them, and we wanted to give it to the National Archives, um, get grants from them uh, for money to uh, digitize this, um, scan it, because um, this, it, it's unfortunate, but you cannot do this without money. Um, it is such a, it's such a historical, the, these letters are like so historically important, but we just don't have the money to do this, so we have to get these grants um, and funding uh, from the National Archives. And um, she, was, uh, she was talking with me about um, like UVA, like their uh, like historical letters and stuff. You used to not be able to really read these unless you paid them huge sums of money, which uh, she did not like. She thought that this is, this should be, this is public history. Like this, this happened. So the, you shouldn't have to pay for this. You should just be able to go to the UVA library and read these things. You shouldn't have to pay them huge sums of money just to read it or publish it or talk about it. Um, uh, what I would have done differently, uh, I would have liked to help and go more. Um, it, it's unfortunate, but uh, Gary, he was a very busy man. Um, he uh, had just had a, a baby with his wife, um, and so he had to deal with that as well as his other job. Um, and so he unfortunately was only able to come on Wednesdays. Um, and I think that's actually been changed to Tuesdays. So uh, so I just wasn't able to go as often as I would have. And I would like to have helped with different stuff. They had uh, different uh, exhibits on John Howard Cock uh, that they were redoing to sort of give other people's voices more. Um, they wanted like exhibits like talking about uh, his slaves and what they thought living under him. Um, and I would have liked to work with the letters more. A lot of my time was spent um, inventorying them just due to my uh, inexperience with reading uh, this cursive and cross-writing, I wasn't able to effectively um, read it and get all the info, unfortunately. Um, so I would have loved to read these letters more because we found some very interesting things. Um, for my future plans, I plan to go to uh, UVA and study in either uh, history or law. Um, it's just, uh, history has always been something that I've been very interested in. So. I'm very interested in continu continuing that, and law has also been something that I'm interested in, so um, I've also wanted to further my advance in that. Um, for advice, I, I do not necessarily think you have to get it done by the end of summer. I think have, doing it in conjunction with the work for the, the uh, BRVGS senior project class, I think was uh, great, and it really helped me to do it. So I think having a good idea of your topic, uh, your internship, and community service, uh, maybe even applying to those places to be able to do them during the school year, I think that's a great idea, but I don't necessarily think you have to do it by the end uh, of the summer. And you definitely shouldn't rush. Um, I think rushing through this, like just getting your hours um, and then like, like your hours like through the first two months or something, and then just never going again, I, I think that's uh, a very 
foolish idea. I think you should take your time with this. But again, with procrastination, it's very easy to put that off and, you know, like, oh, I'll get it done next month and on and on. So you definitely don't want to take too long. You probably want to get, like I was doing, about um, three hours a week every Wednesday, um, sometimes more if uh, I would get something to take home or get another opportunity, like um, a wonderful tour that I went on and even helped in. Um, and uh, you just need to get, you need to be able to get it done in time. Uh, any questions? Um, it's, it's not, it, some cases are definitely harder than other where the ink is like bled into, but most of the time it just takes like, you have to like really look into it. Um, there was, there's quite a few, like I'd say we were probably, it, it was really frustrating to us because we'd pull one out and then we'd be like, oh my gosh, we have to do this. Um, and so it was a lot more frustrating and tedious than hard, I'd say. Uh, I, I don't really understand like why they couldn't just buy more pieces of paper. Like these were probably millionaires because um, they had plantations and stuff. But uh, it was it was it was definitely tedious. But we were able to always read them. Um, we found so uh, John Harwell Cock had a sort of slave education plantation in uh, Alabama, I believe. Uh, he pretty much, he to be liberated and sent to Ethiopia, you had to ex be like, the ex uh, you had to have these certain traits. Um, he called like Peyton Skipworth the uh, like perfect uh, slave because he had these uh, traits. He was uh, very well versed, very well knowledgeable. He was, he learned to read and write, which is something that um, John Hawcock uh, and his wife argued for, which uh, was not a popular idea at all. Um, and uh, we, we, we had letters um, talking about him sending slaves down to this Alabama uh, facility, which was uh, like huge. Like we, uh, I think uh, Gary was the one with it. Um, and he, he found this and he just like, it was like, oh my goodness. Like it, it was like huge to find. And then it was like the next three letters after this were also talking about it. Um, which was just amazing to find. Um, so I'd say those were probably the like most important letters that we found. Um, he was he was definitely majorly um, Virginia. He did have some friends um, in other uh, states. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was obviously mostly in Virginia, but as the president, he pretty much was all of the US. Um, and he was a very good friend to Thomas Jefferson. Um, and, but his influence was mainly in Virginia, I'd say. Um, he, he did like to travel a lot and uh, he worked with the, uh, the temperance movement. Uh, he was very big um, in that and the colonization society. But I'd say his influence was more in those groups than, than outside of them. And everything else that he did was mainly in Virginia, his plantations, uh, the Primo presentation, and all that. Here we go. Um, I, I did originally want to do uh, something with um, like animals, um, but then uh, Mr. Morrison actually recommended that I do something uh, history based because he saw that I liked history a lot. And um, I changed my topic over to that, and I had a much, I had, I had a much easier time like thinking up a topic. I instantly thought I wanted to do something with um, John Harwicock, and uh, I, uh, I reached out to the um, Historical Society, and um, Ms. Johnson has just been amazing to me. Um, like any time I've like I've needed something, she's uh, provided it for me. Uh, so much information in my 
uh, research paper I got from her. Uh, she lent me uh, books um, about Virginia, about Hancock, um, about um, slavery and even architecture. And I, 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 my change of topic was it was like a, it was like a roadblock, but then it, it sort of it smoothened out. It, it was a lot easier to get through this project because I changed my topic. Uh, hi, I'm Connor. Um, most of you probably know me if you're in the senior class. I like computers and music. Uh, those are the two main things. Um, so software development was a great thing to do my project on. Um, this is me online. I have been programming for seven or eight years now, so it's something I've enjoyed for a really long time. Um, and I'd definitely like to go into this in the future. So. This is a very interesting topic to pursue. Um, this is my GitHub. If you know anything about programming, uh, it's a version control system. So people upload their code to this website, and you can see any past version of the code. It's very useful for working in teams. Um, there's some projects that I've made. This is uh, Imaginary Infinity Calculator, which is actually a project that me and uh, Finian over there have been working on for a few years. It's been stagnant for a while, but it's one of their bigger projects. Uh, this is Randfax, which is another thing that I've made. Um, this is actually about to hit a million downloads, so that's pretty exciting. I think this morning it was at 998,000. So uh, this is just, I love software development. I like working with computers, whether that's hardware or software. Um, this is the first computer that I used. It's the old family desktop. It ran Windows XP. Um, that's a Dell Dimension 3000, if you know anything about computers. Um, very low power, very like 2000s-esque computer. Um, but now I've upgraded um, to this. Uh, this is all custom built. I made this all from scratch. Um, so I picked out all of those parts that I wanted specifically, uh, put them all together, and completely configured everything from scratch. Um, I have the three monitors so I can work super efficiently. You got like Spotify and programming and YouTube, whatever you want. Um, so yeah, it's really nice to have a computer that can help me work on stuff like this. Um, so my research question was something relevant. I wanted to know the difference between uh, very common CPU architectures. The CPU is um, typically compared to the brain of the computer. It performs all of the math, the calculations. Um, if you open a program, it's going to start executing instructions on the CPU, telling the computer what to do next. Um, the architectures that I chose were x86-64, which is the most common PC architecture. 
um, if you have a Windows computer or um, even a Linux computer, it's probably running on x86-64. Um, there's also ARM, which is uh, primarily used in cell phones, actually. Uh, most are ARM-based. And also the new Apple M1 Max and M2 Max, those are also ARM-based. Then PowerPC, which is um, an older architecture, it's not used as much as the other two, but I figured I'd throw it in there just because. Um, I found that one of the most obvious and prevalent differences is the difference between instruction set and all the um, different architectures. When you're programming in the lowest level, you're telling the CPU what to do um, manually. You're telling it what calculations to run, um, what file systems to interact with. Um, and the assembly language, which is the programming language that you would use to directly interact with that, um, is different depending on which architecture you use. And that is why, for example, on a software download website, you may notice that it has different versions for x86-64 or ARM. Um, you may notice different download links for that because software that is made for one of these architectures um, can't inherently work on all of them. Um, so that's a very big difference. Another big difference is the power usage between the two. Um, that's the very big difference that ARM has over x86. Um, ARM processors are physically built to be more compact, so they use less power. And ARM also is a RISC architecture, which is reduced instruction set. Um, so there are fewer instructions that you have to choose from. Um, so less memory is used and it uses less power. Um, I actually wanted to do more research into this while I was writing my paper. So I did some benchmarks on the binaries. So that's like the exe files if you've ever used a Windows computer. Um, this data, I'm actually not sure if this is really relevant, but I figured I'd include it. This is some research that I did about um, the different performance um, times of running different benchmarks that I wrote. So I wrote benchmarks for sorting a list. Um, I did a very intensive calculation, and I also calculated factorials from 1 to 4,000. And I ran this on all these different architectures. Uh, the reason why I'm not sure if it's relevant is because I was emulating all of these on my x86 computer. So I was running the ARM and PowerPC versions on my x86 computer through an emulator, which basically converts the instructions to x86. So I'm wondering if that may be why these two are slower, um, but I figured the data was interesting to me anyway. Um, the more interesting data that I collected, though, was this, which was the binary optimization, so the size of the actual file. Um, with no optimization and uh, size optimization in the compiler, and when I stripped off the debug symbols, you could see that ARM was consistently smaller than all of the other architectures. Um, I found this really interesting, and I tried to do some more research into it. And I found that um, I came to the conclusion that it was probably due to the fact that um, x86 has variable length instructions. So with ARM, every instruction that you give the computer will be 32 bits in length. But x86, um, the, it can vary. So it can be 36 or 32 bits, or it can be more than that. So I'm, that's my guess as to why this data turned out the way that it is. And PowerPC is also similar to ARM. It's also a RISC architecture, um, which is why that's also smaller than x86. Um, this is who I did my internship with, with uh, Josh Gifford, Brian Hodges, and Jordan Hudson. Um, these men work for the IT department in the school. And I actually met them um, because I found a security vulnerability in the school's computer system and reported it to them. So I had already had a connection with them, and I figured I'd ask them if I could do an internship with them, and they agreed. Um, they've been really nice and helpful, but they've also stood back and let me do my own thing and figure out what I need to do, um, which is this. This is um, the bus pass program that they use in the other schools. Um, you can, this is the old one right here. This was last written in 2010, and this is my updated version that I wrote. Um, I'm actually calling it uh, Anubis now, which is a name that Finian made. 
because um, this one was called Bus Information System, or BIS. So this is a new BIS, Anubis, which is also a uh, Egyptian god. So I thought the name worked pretty well. And you can see this version, I don't know, to me, it's pretty ugly. Um, no offense to whoever wrote it. <laughs> um, but this is a lot more modern, a lot more uh, security features are built in. Um, you can see this is the log of all the bus pass. So when you fill out a bus pass, it will log it to the database. And you can view that all here. Um, you have stuff like filtering out a date range of bus passes, exporting to a CSV. Um, I think if I go back, uh, I'd add a little thing to show the connection status of the database. And yeah, I don't know, it's more modern, uh, using more modern ways to interact with the printer. And that's what my community service was, as well as my internship, which were combined together. Um, this is not quite done yet. I still need to finish implementing all the printing because we've been having a lot of issues with that. Um, Dymo, the company who makes the printer, doesn't really tell you how to use the printer at all. You just have to sort of figure it out. So we've been working on that a lot and trying to get it to function. Um, if I were to do stuff differently, um, or no, it's not that yet, apparently. Um, this definitely re reinforced my interest in programming. Um, so it's definitely something I want to go into when I get a job or when I go to college. Um, I already knew that to some extent, but this definitely showed me that I could work in a corporate environment, a professional environment, and I really enjoyed doing it. It also showed me that I could work independently on a more complex project that had certain requirements without needing necessarily a ton of help from higher ups. Um, and if I were to do stuff differently, um, definitely paying attention to the time management between handling all of the different classes. Um, that was a big thing. Um, procrastination. Well, everybody said that um, if you're procrastinating, pro procrastinate right by doing other work, um, which I definitely did a lot. And yeah, you just have to, senioritis hits, so you have to get through that. Um, I would also start thinking of a research question now if you're a junior, because I just sort of had to come, come up with something at the last second. Um, because I was not prepared for that. I did not see that coming. <laughs> um, my future plans, I'm enrolled in JMU. I'm going to get a major in computer science and a minor in music. Um, and after that, I'm going into some job with programming or system administration. Um, so any questions? Um, that's a good question. I think it was sometime in sixth grade um, when everybody was making all their little companies and stuff, we made one that um, produced video games. Um, so that really showed me that I would, I really enjoy programming and um, the logic, figuring out problems, solving problems. Um, I really enjoyed that aspect of it. and. If you are able to write something and then the computer just does it, um, I don't know, there's something about that that's really nice. Uh, Aiden. Uh, the bus pass system, um, when you were in Central or Carysbrook or the middle school, uh, you might have remembered having to, I don't know if you ever rode the bus, but if you ever had to ride a different bus than you normally would, um, you would have to get a bus pass for that. So you would have to get prior parent permission and all of that. And this is just a system for the school to keep track of which bus passes were administered to which students. And it also prints out a physical pass that the student can show to the bus driver to show that they have permission to get onto the bus. Uh, cash. Um, I don't know how it got that popular. I had realized that I needed something to generate random facts. So I made it and just put it out there in case anybody wanted it. And somehow other people found it. I guess there wasn't any other option for them to use. So I guess people needed that. And then 
more and more people started downloading it. Uh, I think I saw Elizabeth first. Oh, Anthony. Oh, no, they're going to be using it in the schools once I actually finish that. Um, yeah, Elizabeth. Uh, I've definitely considered cybersecurity. Um, that's a lot of stuff to worry about, though, so I don't know if I would go into that. Um, I really do just like writing programs, making stuff, do stuff, solving problems that people have. Um, I really like that aspect of it, so I'm probably going to go into making software, like software engineering. Uh, Aiden. Uh, I am completely self-taught. I just had an interest, and then I started looking stuff up until I figured it out. Uh, whenever I have a problem, I just work at it until I find a solution, and then I use that solution whenever I encounter that issue again. I have taken some classes in the school, um, but I had already known all of the material. So, I don't know. Uh, Abby. Um, like the Rand Facts app? It generates random facts. You can use it in other programs. So if you're a programmer and you need to generate random facts, you can just uh, import my thing and tell it to give you a fact. So. Um, I had not had a name. And then, oh, to program it. Um, I started, I think, beginning of September. And I've been working. Um, on and off on it for a while. I definitely got my 30 hours logged, um, but I think it's probably more around between 50 and 70 hours now of working on it. It's mainly due to the printer issues that we've been having. The rest of it wasn't too difficult. Uh, the UI design, so actually the design of how it looks took a while. Um, but other than that, everything is pretty straightforward. Um, they were pretty loose on what I had to follow. They obviously wanted me to follow like good practices and how the code looked, and they wanted me to uh, well document everything so that they could use it in the future, uh, which makes sense. Um, I don't really know if there was anything in particular that was weird, but it was just standard. Um, make your code look good and readable and make sure other people can use the program.
All right, let's hear it for Connor. Let me know. Hello. So as it says, I did a project about computers and education. And computers have just always been, for me, a topic I've been interested in since they're me using my first computer when I was about eight, running Ubuntu 12.04, which was the first operating system I ever really used. And then still to today, obviously, I'm still using computers a lot. There are the, some of the far too many computers I have now. I'm now mostly using Arch Linux, and that's better. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that's, I've just always been interested in computers and done a lot of things with them. And so for this project, what I, my research question for my paper was, um, what are the best uses of computers for education? And so I did research on things like student information systems, which are things like PowerSchool, which manage student grades and attendance and stuff like that. And learning management systems, which are things like Google Classroom or Canvas which manage student assignments and allow them to complete, be completed online and things like that. And then just writing with a computer using a word processor or LaTeX, something like that to allow you to write without having to rewrite everything every time you make a mistake on paper. And then accessibility systems like screen readers to allow blind people to consume printed or otherwise written content um, or Braille things, maybe, for blind people. You can get Braille displays uh, to just allow students who otherwise would not be able to access certain parts of the curriculum to still access them and participate the same as all the other students. Um, and then I did an internship with the University of Virginia Physics Department with Mike Beveridge, a computer systems engineer and Windows expert, Rick Marshall, the director of laboratories, who was just in charge of all the undergraduate laboratories, and we actually set up the computer systems for an undergraduate laboratory in this internship, which, so we had to work with him, obviously, to make sure it was the way they wanted the laboratory to be. And Brian Wright, who is an information technology manager and a Linux and Unix expert. Um, so the first part thing we did on the internship was we set up a FOG server, which stands for Free Open Source Ghost. It's a piece of software that will run on a server, and it takes a copy of all the files on the hard disk of a computer and allows you to deploy that copy or image to other computers. So you can set up one computer in your lab the way you want, take an image of that, and then deploy that to all the other computers in the lab automatically instead of having to manually configure each one. And so you can instantly like reconfigure it if it breaks or something and not have to do a bunch of manual labor. Um, and then, of course, after that, we set up the actual image that would be deployed to all those computers. And that was an image using Windows 10 with a bunch of software on it for using in the lab, like LabVIEW and MATLAB. And most of the time of this stage was just trying to activate MATLAB and LabVIEW because these are, these are these huge proprietary pieces of software that require a license key. And their activation is just so confusing and obtuse. And so it really was a, a lot of time spent just banging our heads against the wall, trying to figure out how to get the software to believe that we really had a license to use it. Um, but eventually we did do it, and now we have, I think, 10 or so computers configured using this image in a lab. And then once we had all the computers configured, I actually went to the room where the lab would be set up, which was actually in a different building because the physics building itself is undergoing renovation. So this is why we had to move it somewhere. So this is over in the, one of the engineering buildings. Um, so once we got there, once we had all the computers set up, I actually went over to the lab and put together Ethernet cables, learned how to do that, which is not like an incredibly technical skill, but still a useful thing to know how to do. And then I actually ran all the cables through the ceiling, which again, just a useful thing to know how to do with computers. Um, so all the computers could communicate with the server that would deploy their image. And then after that, during the school year, I, or actually rather, the legacy of my internship is that 
all of this work I did, I wrote down instructions for how to replicate this setup and set up another computer system to act like this. And all of that is licensed under Creative Commons Zero, so it's in the public domain, so anyone can use it or make their own new setup instructions based on it, do whatever they want, and that's available online there. Um, so yeah, anyone can replicate this setup and create similar things, which could be useful for other universities or schools or anyone who wants a bunch of managed computers. And then after that, during the school year, I did a community service project with the Fluvanna County High School, which I presume you know what that is, um, where I worked with Kristen Davis, who is an informational technology instructional technology resource teacher, <laughs> and Christopher Templeton, who is a technology specialist. And what I did with them was first I went through and helped Mr. Templeton with replacing all of the teacher workstations, their desktop computers in all the classrooms, um, because they needed to upgrade all of those. So I went through and helped him take out the old computers, put in the new ones, and a lot of time was spent sorting out just issues with drivers and things after they'd been put in with weird hardware that the teacher might have, or a lot of it was just weird display issues, trying to get the displays to use the right resolution and be matched with the projector and everything. Um, and that, that was also interesting because we got to work with teachers and trying to sort out what they wanted and just working with a user and communicating the, the, what, how the system works and what they need and everything. And then after that, I worked with Kristen Davis to just try to figure out what could be done with the school's fleet of 30 VR headsets, which they bought a few years ago now. Um, and before they were really able to do too much with them, Google Daydream, which is the software that they ran, just Google dropped support for it. So not only did it become harder to keep them working, but just no more new software was being developed for them, which really limits what you can do with this expensive fleet of VR headsets. Um, so we went through and just looked around and tried to find uses for them, a lot of web-based VR things, um, which are still work pretty well because they use the WebXR standard, which is still supported. So there are still things being developed for that, even if there aren't native things still being developed for the Daydream platform itself. And then we also discovered that if you ever have one of these, don't let it upgrade its software. If you just let it do the latest Android update that it wants to do, it appears to brick it permanently. So we may have one less of those now. Still haven't figured out how to fix that, but maybe it'll work again someday. But anyway, we did still, for that small price, figure out a bunch of things we can do with them and just figure out that the, they do are usable, even if not as much as they originally were when they were new. And then during this whole experience, what I learned about myself was that I'm better at problem solving than I thought, just trying to figure out the weird activation issues and how to deal with the weird VR headsets that I've never experienced before and trying to just figure out how any of that works. And also that I'm better at interacting with the end users of the things I'm setting up than I thought, because I, I did a lot of interacting with the teachers setting up their computers and explaining to them what was going on and why things were a bit different than they used to be and how to, how to get everything the way they wanted it to. And I, I realized that I'm actually not too bad at just talking to people and fixing their problems um, with the computers that I'm setting up for them. Um, if I were to do this again, one thing I would definitely do differently is I would either do my internship earlier, correct, and know all the information I needed to have. And also, there is after the, at, at the beginning of the fall semester, there is a informational meeting that BRVGS does to give us instructions for this whole project and everything. And I think it would have been really useful if I could have had that before I did my internship, instead of having to do the internship, and then afterwards I get this meeting and it tells me what I should have done differently, and, but it's too late now. So I kind of wish I had just done it during the fall instead. And then also just, I would have taken a lot more photos because you saw I didn't have too many photos of my actual internship or community service. And it's, it's there's nothing you can do about that after the fact, you're already done. But it, it would have made it much easier to give this presentation had I had more photos of the things I had done. And also photos m more of me and the other people I was working with because that was something that was really hard to get. Um, and in the future, I plan to be either a software developer, developer or a Linux, Linux system administrator. Um, I'm planning to get a degree in computer science from UVA. Hopefully, I might end up transferring there from PVCC. But definitely want to get a degree in either computer science or computer engineering. 
um, so I can do computer things. So yeah, that, that's what I did. Any questions about it? Um, well, the biggest benefit is obviously that it is open source, so everyone can see the source code, they know what it's doing, and it's obviously very valuable to know what your computer is doing and know that it's not running some software that's taking all of your information and sending it off to either the government, some criminals trying to do things with it, or whatever. And you just don't have that trust with something closed source that you, you don't know what it's doing. It's just something someone gave you that is mysteriously doing stuff and it's doing what you want, but who knows what else it's doing. And then also just usability and speed. Windows is very uncooperative. <laughs> Jackson. Uh, I just had connections with UVA because my dad works with UVA. Um, and he was actually one of the people I worked with. He was the information technology head person at the physics department. So that helped me to just get in there with those people who really know what they're doing. Um, Aiden? Unclear. I was never really told. They just bought a bunch of them a few years ago and never ended up really doing much with them. And then they just sat until I came around and they said, hey, we have these. Do you want to try to help us figure out what to do with these? And I kind of did. Again? I mean, a lot of it was just the fact that I, most of what I've done the past 10 years has been using computers um, and using, uh, I've, I've done a lot, I've used them I, probably in a more in-depth way than some other people because I, I've always been fascinated with like, how they actually work and making them do exactly what I want and not just settling for them sort of doing what I want and working around them. I've always wanted to write software to make them do what I want or just configure my operating system. So I've, just, I've always been pretty deep into configuring everything and so I know a fair amount about how Linux works internally. The, it was a kind of a struggle dealing with Windows because I am very unfamiliar with that. But yeah, I've just used them a lot and learned a lot by just trial and error and just doing everything I possibly can and seeing what happens. <laughs> Anthony? Yeah, I definitely think that would be better. And that was actually something someone mentioned at that thing. Um, I, I don't remember why. There was some scheduling reason why they we're having trouble doing that. But yeah, that definitely would be a lot better. I think that would, I would have done a lot of a better internship had I been able to get all that information beforehand. It, I, don't, I, I don't know that much about how to actually teach a class, so it's hard to say. But I, there's definitely content out there. You can watch, there are a lot of videos content available which could be useful for giving like a tour of some historical place or something without the students having to physically go there. Um, but I don't know, there, there are a lot of possibilities. It's, it's hard to tell. They're a strange device. Yeah, right.
Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, my name's Owen. Uh, as Mr. Morrison said, I'm a musician. So I decided I was going to do my project on how music affects the brain. Um, so why did I choose to study this? Um, as Morrison said, I do have quite a background in music. I've been uh, playing any form of music since I was like three. Uh, I've been interested in percussion generally as a focus, uh, being as I was in the marching band this past year. I played quads. But I've been in the marching band since eighth grade, all in drumline. Um, but that's not all I've done. I've been in band since fifth grade. I played the trumpet in fifth grade, actually, which was quite unfortunate. Not a fan. Um, and then uh, I was almost contracted to Spirit of Atlanta. Spirit of Atlanta is a part of DCI, which is basically um, like the NFL of marching band, pretty much. So DCI is like a professional marching band. You get contracted. You go to play for them for the season. I got a call back, actually but I had to drop out because I torqued and strained my knee, so I couldn't actually march for the season. Um, so, yeah. Um, furthering my education. So, uh, as a musician, I'd like to go and do something in my life, throughout my life with music, as it is my greatest passion and it has been for all my life. Um, I'd like to go to JMU, Clemson, or LSU to primarily focus actually in computer science, where I'd like to major in computer science and get a minor in music. Um, it's quite an odd uh, combination for computer science and music, but it's two passions that I've always had, and I could see definitely doing a career in either or both. And then I was just generally interested in the topic, you know? So um, music has, uh, it's greatly expanded. So there are millions of songs. All of them can be different. All of them will make you feel different. You don't really know how they're going to make you feel until you listen to them, because they're all different. And I'll deep, I'll deep dive into more um, how they make you feel different specifically. But um, yeah, I was just kind of interested because everyone has those moments where they're you could be sad and you'll listen to music. You'll be driving home or something and you'll enter like the flow state from music. And I kind of wanted to know why is that? Why does that happen from music and not like an audio book? Because you're not going to go to a party and jam out to an audiobook. Um, I, I could be wrong, but I don't see that happening. Um, so for my research, the first thing I wanted to deep dive into was the genre. So obviously, Slash from Guns N' Roses and Beethoven, they're going to make you feel different. Rock music has been completely proven to uh, increase your adrenaline, and it'll just kind of like make you ramp up. It'll make you excited. You, you're going to want to do something when you listen to it, as opposed to like, Beethoven. You're not going to want to run a marathon after you listen to Moonlight Sonata. That's just not how that works. Um, Moonlight Sonata and just classical music in general, it's pro been proven to reduce your stress, your anxiety. So it's just kind of interesting. And that's more what I researched on is how that changes. Because it's not just the kind of music, it's the overall factors that contribute to the music. Um, lyricism. So as books do, Words are, words are humans' greatest uh, achievements. It's all we can do, really. We don't communicate telepathy through telepathy. You might. You could. Probably not. Um, so through words, we can uh, activate the left side of our brain. It's kind of how that all works. And it actually releases oxytocin. Oxytocin is the feel-good chemical. And it's released through the amygdala in your brain. And it'll actually travel. And it'll kind of put you in that flow state, uh, as I talked about. So. The flow state's basically just where you, 
you're on autopilot essentially you really don't you know what you're doing but you don't really know what you're doing because the, the oxytocin has really taken complete control of your brain it's not you it's that controlling you now um, and then the overall musical structure this is how the genre changes this is how all of these factors work so the tempo I mean like a lot of songs can be fast, they can be slow, and that will contribute. The overall structure of the music can change just from small differences. Uh, for instance, Let It Be by The Beatles and uh, Jump by Van Halen. They have the exact same build through uh, keys and all that. It's just the tempo is different, the words are different. It really changes through minor components like that, and they're completely different songs. You feel completely different listening to both of them. Um, and then I wanted to talk more about where it affects the brain, so my paper is primarily focused on the neuroscience part of it, um, as opposed to the music part of it. So uh, it'll affect your uh, amygdala, which is down um, in the auditory receptive area. It'll affect the nucleus accumbens, which is basically the where the uh, oxytocin goes after it's released from the amygdala. So basically it will just completely control your brain. You don't know what you're doing, like in that flow state. And then the, uh, the cerebellum, which is the base of your brain, that's how it connects to your muscles. Uh, the brain connects to the muscles, and that will completely get taken control of. So it's really interesting. Um, I really had a rough time uh, researching this because a lot, of, a lot of the research pieces that I found from this were actually German. There were a lot of them from the Max Planck Institute for Brain uh, Sciences. There was a lot of German translation I had to do. There were a lot of graphs I didn't know how to read that I now know how to read, but it was, it was really difficult to study all of this. Um, my internship. I did my internship with uh, Mr. Samuel Campbell. He's the director of bands here at Fluvanna County High School. Um, so basically for my internship, I worked with him uh, through writing the music. So this coming year, they're gonna be doing a show called Don't Look Up. That's gonna be the marching band show this year. Um, basically, I, was, I, I wrote the drumline parts for this show. Um, there were some from the show, but I had to rewrite all of them. I've spent easily 100 hours or more working on this uh, because it's just such a task because I, you can screw up just the tiniest bit. I've had to restart four times. It's, it's insanely difficult, and you really, don't, you really don't know until it's done how it's going to all turn out. Um, so yeah, and my community service. So uh, my community service is not done. My community service is ongoing. Um, I'm actively working with the FCHS um, uh, guidance office. So I'm going to create playlists that have been completely catered and carefully selected songs uh, for different activities, such as working out or cleaning at home. This will all be through my research and the research I've done to use these factors and uh, carefully select the songs that uh, I feel through my research would be most optimized to um, cater towards these activities. So my advice for future seniors, you're gonna hear it a lot, but pick a topic you're really interested in. It will make your project better uh, no matter what. I mean, you could, you could completely bomb it like I probably did. And uh, as long as you're interested, it's, it's good. And then uh, be prepared to adapt. So that was an interesting one. Everything is gonna change. You really don't know what's gonna happen. Originally, my internship was going to be with a neuroscientist at Martha Jefferson, but he ended up taking a month's vacation, so I couldn't get that done within my time frame. So I had to completely change gears. And, you know, you just have to be ready for that kind of thing. You have to be able to overcome that uh, to keep working on this project to make it great. Uh, any questions? Uh, Jackson? Um, specifically on pain relief, yeah, uh, music can be completely, it, it can be a relief, you know, um, we could be, and they do it in physical therapy, I'm sure a lot of other people could tell you, I didn't completely dive into this, um, this specific aspect of it, but yeah, music can completely, it, it can heal you, essentially, it's a, it's a hippie way of putting it, but music can heal you. Uh, Anthony?
Um, so I don't know exactly how many I'm doing yet. That's still kind of an ongoing thing I'm trying to figure out. But um, I have one based on workout, which is like high adrenaline music. So it's going to be a higher tempo. It's going to make you want to go. And it, it will essentially put you in that flow state. There's the cleaning one, which is similar, but it's not exactly the same because you really need to have that drive to get that done because no one likes cleaning, literally no one. Um, and then I plan on doing a few more. So driving could be one of them. Uh, that's one I'm exploring. I'm trying to figure out exactly how I want to do that because with that kind of thing, people can respond differently. So there are, there are a few that I'm trying to consider here. Um, There definitely is. Um, both of them are they're, they're very, very complicated tasks um, through coding and writing these parts, um, both of which you can mess up the smallest bit and you're just completely screwed. And you can spend hours trying to find the one thing you messed up on, and it, it'll completely mess you up. Um, but yeah, there are definitely similarities just in the way that you do it, both of which you have to have extreme knowledge of the topic that you're the topic that you're doing it on. So, yeah, definitely. Uh, Thalen? Uh, if you don't want the flow state? Uh, yeah, there definitely are. So um, I found through my research that some of the heaviest genres to put you in that flow state were rock and rap. It's, it's, it's an interesting combination, and I, I wasn't completely sure why. But on um, both of them, they're high tempo. They have kind of like a more bearing. They'll like rather than um, rather than like kind of hold you where you are and like you know make you want to do something. Both of which they they kind of drive you. So it's interesting. But yeah, there are some that you definitely don't want to listen to if you want that flow state. Classical music is a great example. Um, most for most people. It will not get you get you what you need. That's why it's recommended for when you're studying because it'll keep you hyper focused. Um, which it's it's definitely an interesting way to do it. But uh, yeah, so classical music is probably the greatest to not get you in that flow state. Uh, B. Um, yeah, that's a piece of that oxytocin part that I was talking about. Um, so basically your mind, if you're a classical musician, you've been geared to kind of listen for those smaller nuances that it has. So with music, there you can just listen to it and you'll be fine. But if you're a musician, your brain is going to be hyper-focused on that kind of thing. So basically, uh, the classical music, you're going to be hyper-focused. You're going to be listening for those nuances that, um, that you play, that you perform because your brain has been completely trained to listen for those and fix those. and So yeah, it's just kind of the way your brain has been built. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Kirsten? Uh, yeah, so the biggest, the biggest reason is just life experiences. You know, people have been through different things, they've gone different ways, because everyone has a different path. So you could have a certain memory that ties to a certain song, and that will completely change your perspective of that song. Um, so yeah, life experiences is probably the biggest, the biggest uh, factor. And then Kirsten again. It can absolutely completely change your mood. Like when you're, when you're sad, if you want to, you can amplify those feelings. But you can also listen to something that will completely do like a 180. It will turn you around. It can make you happy, depending on the circumstances, of course. But yeah, it can completely change your mood.
and this is just for the recording. Okay. And I'll, I can find the other ears. I can't tell that ears. Okay. And for my voice, it's not. All right, let's get them started again, right? Um, I'd like to thank Miss John A. Groom for the call. So, okay, this young man, uh, Hello, my name is Elijah Anderson, and I am part of Blue Ridge Virtual Governor School, and this is my senior capstone project. This is about clinical technologies and how the EMR system has affected the medical field. What is my research question? My research question relates to how EMR is also known as electrical medical records um, affected the medical field throughout the years since it has been introduced, meaning how has it affected things like patient care, how has it affected things like since it was introduced, how did it create, how can I say, it create a new way for the medical professionals to interact with their patients? How did it create these things that can help the, uh, the medical professionals with these patients? My research paper, my research paper talked about a couple things. I first talked about the historical aspect of the MR system and how it was introduced and how the medical medical professionals had to adapt to that new situation and how quickly they had to adapt to that because it, when it was introduced, it came in very quickly. It was not over a matter of time. It was very quick and they had to adapt to it so they can take care of the patients properly. Um, something else I also talked about was the difference between paper records and electronic records. So the paper records are usually just on paper and electronic records are obviously on like a computer and how they were developed and when the first paper records were developed and how the electrical records were developed. The, another thing that I talked about in my paper was the advantages and disadvantages of an EMR system. I first talked about how one advantage is that if, for example, if I had a patient and I needed a patient to go to a hospital besides where I would be, like say for example, I was at UVA and I needed a patient to go to VCU, I would send them to VCU and I would be able to send the documents in the computer to the VCU hospital and the doctors at VCU will be able to take care of that patient before I even before they even get there. So when the patient gets there, they'll be able to be to be um, taken care of in a good way. Another thing that I talked about as an advantage is that it is very quick and easy. It's not as it takes as long time as a paper record would. It's also easily accessible to the um, doctors. If the doctors needed to see the information, they can just pull it up right on the computer instead of having go through files and look through all the medical records to try to find it. They can just go through the computer and be able to find the patients, what the patient needs quickly. And some disadvantages of the EMR system, however, is that if the power were to go out, the electronic medical record would not work at all. You have to record everything on a piece of paper. You would have to do all these things um, to, on a piece of paper, like to take the vitals, the blood pressure, the heart rate, the respiratory rate of these uh, patients and put them onto the to the paper and then you will have to wait until the power cone will come back on and put it into the uh, system again. Another disadvantage of the EMR system, however, is that 
it is kind of expensive to input and it takes a long time for people to understand how it works. I will talk about more of that in my internship slide. Continuing, what was the answer to my research question? My answer that I gathered after doing all my research for my research paper, I gathered that it has helped tremendously the um, medical field, but there are, even though there are some down, downsides, there is overall helped the medical field tremendously and it has been a great asset to that. Continuing on to my internship, I, I internshiped at um, UVA Primary and Specialty Care Clinic at Zion Crossroads and I mentored under George Luzaik. He is a manager there at um, the clinic and he helps manages the nurses with anything that they might have a problem with like technology or electronical. Um, he, before he worked at UVA, he's been in the medical field for about seven years and he worked at a physical therapy um, clinic and he also managed there. Continuing on, I, um, I shadowed under two nurses, Claire on my left and Kendra on my right, and they, I looked as they took care of the patients and their vitals and I watched as they took care of the patients and I saw how, when they took the vitals, how they put it into the EMR system and how and what they did for that. I saw how I saw how the, it was able to send the files to files to the doctor in any kind of way in a in an easy and efficient way for the doctor. Sorry. Continuing on, this is Rachel. I also mentored under her. She is a registered nurse, and I. Um, I, she was my expert interview, and I asked her some questions about the MR system, how she felt about it, how she liked it, what some things that she disagreed with, she didn't like about it. One thing she specifically pointed out was that it had too many ways to do one simple thing. There was too many ways just to, if you, for example, if you wanted to say the patient is waiting for the doctor and you need to tell them that, hey, you can go see the doctor now, there'd be like eight different ways just to do that one simple thing. And if you needed to tell someone about how to do that, it would be really difficult because there's too many ways to just do that one thing. Um, another thing that she talked about was that it is takes a long time for someone to learn how to do that. It takes a long time for someone to understand how the um, electronic medical records work. It sometimes takes about, like it says a couple months for them to get adapted to it. They usually first start shadowing the, um, the like a nurse if they're a nurse and they start shouting the nurse and see how they put the information into the uh, electronic medical records and see how long it took. If she also suggested that there should be like maybe a program to help them understand how to do these problems. This is an example of a, the computer system that would be used at the clinic and what it would look like for the nurses and the managers there. I modeled myself as the patient to, to get their blood pressure taken, and this is an example of what, what the nurses would do when I shadowed the, the patients. When I shadowed the nurses, and as they took care of the patients, I saw how they put it into the um, EMR system. Continuing on to my community service, I serve my community service here at Flavana County High School under Tyler Golden, and he is an athletic trainer here at Flavana County High, and he has been here for a couple years now. He helps with the athletes with any kind of pain or uh, any kind of any kind of problems they might have with their body. What I did was I helped with anything that they might have a problem with the athletes. I helped him, and for example, right here is called something called a game ready. It uses a cuff around the athlete's leg and it inserts cold water into the cuff, and it uses that cold water to help with any kind of pain or inflammation of that area. Um, right here is just an ice bag. It is used for also from inflammation or pain and soreness. That's a common thing for this. It's pain and uh, soreness. And that um, is a big problem. Another thing is that it uses sound waves. Sound waves go into, uses the ultrasound, and that uses sound waves to go into a, a athlete's leg and uses it to help soothe any kind of pain that they might have. Another thing that they, is a problem is soreness and pain and that is used right here which is called a heat pack and it's just used for like any kind of soreness pain or like tenseness of like a muscle what would i do differently one thing i would want to do differently is i would like to interview more of the medical professionals i worked at with with at the clinic i wanted to learn more about what problems they might have with the emr system what things they might 
disagree with. Um, I wanted to do like a survey and ask them through the computer, but unfortunately something was wrong with my email and it just couldn't work, but I really wanted to try to do that. My advice to future seniors, one advice I have, I know it's been said for like 15 times now, um, that to make sure to not procrastinate it is very important to make sure you try to do your work. I unfortunately sometimes have a problem procrastinating and I, one problem, one way I help fix that problem is that I would try to spread out my work throughout the week and I would try to make sure nothing that I, I everything I needed to be done was tried to, was done, bef tried, was done before the time it was due. And that was one problem, the way I fixed that problem. Another uh, advice for future seniors is to try to pick something that is your passion. Don't pick anything that you think is, might be easy or simple or just easy to come by. I want you to pick something that is like truly something that you enjoy, something that you never, like something that you truly do want to do, like in your career path or maybe something you just enjoy in your free time. Because if you pick something that's simple, you're just going to do something like, oh, I'm just going to do it and finish it in a very quick way. But if you do something you're passionate about, you're actually going to put it into the work and you're actually going to do better with the, your grades. Because if you do something that you enjoy, you're obviously going to put more care and more effort and you want to be more proud of whatever you're doing. So I would suggest you do something that you're really passionate about. What are my future plans? My future plans is either to attend VCU or George Mason, and I would like to major in a major in biology and follow a, a path in the medical field. I'm not 100% sure yet. I think I want to become a PA, and I would like to maybe through the PA then become like something in a dermatology kind of way. Uh, that is something I would like to enjoy and reason why I'm really interested in medical field is because I like helping people. I really like helping um, people with their problems. I really like the one-on-one -on -one situations. And one thing this internship has helped me figure out is that even though I do not regret it, I do very much enjoy it. Um, one problem I had with it was that I wish I was more interactive with the patients. After shadowing the nurses, I did enjoy it's like seeing how the nurses talk with the patients, how they figure out their problems, how if there's anything wrong with patients, the nurses would help them. And I really enjoy just talking with the, um, the patients, not the patients, with the nurses about the problems. Is there any questions? Yes. Um, sorry. Um, yes, in the Blue Ridge class last year, I had two classes about um, health and humanities, like with Haley's project, and also intro to explorations of healthcare and like career paths. Um, also, I've taken EMT currently this year, and all three of those classes has helped me figure out that I really do enjoy the medical field, and I do want to do something in that career path. Is there any other questions? Thank you. Yeah. You? All right, you can do this. This is for the computer.
Oh, bye. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Kaya Barnes Hu, and today I'm going to be talking about youth within the film industry, or rather, film production through the eyes of children. So, here's just a little table of contents to help you, you know, see where I'm going. So, as long as I can remember, I've always been interested in watching movies and TV shows, but as time progressed, I really realized I'm more interested in the behind the scenes and seeing the process of how to make these projects. And over time, I realized this is something I'm kind of interested in. It's you know something that generally takes my interest but I didn't really take it seriously because I was focused on a bunch of different things. But what really caught my attention for this topic in specifics is what's it like being in front of the camera and behind the camera? Is there a distinct difference between the two? Because um, when I got my camera, I realized I really love making these projects and I really love showing it through the camera. But then I wondered, is there a difference when you're the actor instead of being the director? And what also led me to this was Jeanette McCurdy's book. If you know, Jeanette McCurdy is one of my favorite childhood actors um, in one of my favorite shows, like Carly. And she wrote a book called I'm Glad My Mom Died. I know, morbid. But she talks about her experience in um, acting, especially at such a young age of like 12, 13, and 14 years old and the toxic environment and the struggles that she went through, especially with things like eating disorders and bulimia and um, abuse from even the producers and her mother. And even then, there was also more controversies in this with more of my childhood actors coming out with their own stories. And I really had to step back and be like, is this really what I grew up on? Because I thought it was such a happy thing. But then I realized it's, it's really toxic. And I wondered, they were always in front of the camera, what if it was different if they were behind the camera? And this even um, ranges to something smaller as um, influencers and social media and even things like family channels on YouTube. There's been so much controversy, and I've watched a bunch of videos on it with these families exploiting their own children for content and um, constantly putting their face on the screen for other people's enjoyment. And they don't, and it's obvious they don't necessarily take into consideration of the child's feelings, because sometimes they don't want to be in front of the camera. But for clout, they decide to keep them in front of the camera. So this then leads to my research, which is how does the betrayal of youth behind and in front of the camera affect the opinions of the community towards the film industry? And as much as I could have uh, gone in depth and looked through so many um, different videos and documents, I decided to ask uh, child filmmakers myself who were in my community service and internship to get their own personalized opinions. So, am I making that? Hi, my name is Hi. Thank you. 
So after that, and here is just um, some answers to the questions I asked my mentor to tell me, you know, his perspective on my subject. And just a little summary, he kind of agrees the same thing as me. It's when kids are the ones being able to make these projects, they're able to um, project their uniqueness and their own imagination in the form of a project rather than when kids are like the ones being recorded from somebody else, it's like there's this pressure that they have. They have to be perfect. They have to have certain standards and um, reach expectations. And it creates such a toxic environment for them. And definitely he betrayed that in his question. So for my internship, I entered at Lighthouse Studios, which is by the Old Vinegar Hill Theater. Um, I realized it was um, very tight knit. It was a very small space, um, but I loved it so much. Um, this is the classroom that I was in that um, I would also be in with the kids. And in this classroom, I learned how to use various film equipment such as a, a Canon camera, um, mics, um, tripods, and 
um, various things for special effects and stuff and even different editing software. And also during my internship, I was invited to different places. Um, I was invited to the uh, Paramount Theater in which we watched um, uh, kids' films that they made during the summer, which is really fun and interesting to see. Um, I went to the, I think it's called the IX Art Park, if I'm saying that right. Um, here, um, I was helping promoting Lighthouse Studios to other people since it was such a small business. So here I was basically almost acting like an employee and spreading the word to other people. So I definitely had to step outside of my comfort zone and go to a person and be like, hey, sir, would you like to learn about Lighthouse Studios? It was very hard for me, but it was a great experience, and I met a lot of people through that. And so this leads me to my community service. And for my community service, I worked with the Boys and Girls Club. Um, every Tuesday, I went to Lighthouse Studios and helped them with their own individual projects, in which was going to be projected, but because of time, they couldn't. But um, through various classes, see, this is me helping them record one of their dance competitions, which is really fun. Um, you know, we went through the downtown mall. We had uh, various projects to do during that time. I learned a lot of things, and it was definitely um, a very fun experience for me because I learned so much through those kids. And I realized they had so much creativity and imagination in their tiny little brains. And I also realized this environment that they were in, it was such a positive environment, and it was, it was very heartwarming to me to witness this because, you know, just seeing them really happy made me happy too, as cringy as it is. And um, these are my mentors, um, Zach and Rachel Lane. Um, they taught me so much during my time there. Um, I'm so thankful that they took the time to, you know, handle all of my questions because I did ask a lot. And um, they were amazing and yeah. So my experience, what I definitely took from that is this is what I want to do in the future. I mean, you know, as we grow up, we go through different career choices and we're like, oh, no, I want to be a singer. I want to be a dancer. I want to be a rapper. I want to go on American Idol. I want to do all of this. And I went through that, too. But through this internship, I learned that I want to be a filmmaker. This is my career choice. And I am absolute about that now. And I have no regrets for that. I'm, I'm very solid in where I am. And this experience, I don't really think there was something I could have done differently because I learned so much about myself. I was able to communicate with people who I didn't know and, you know, be able to call people on the phone and be like, hey, I want to do this. Hey, I want to do that. Because I could not imagine myself doing that at 13. So, you know, this experience has taught me so much. And because of the hardships that I went through it, I don't think I would change anything. About it. And so my advice for future seniors, I'm not going to say don't procrastinate. I can't really say that because I'm a hypocrite because I procrastinated through this whole thing. So, um, but I will say push through, speak up and be authoritative. This is your chance to do what you want to do. You can't ask your mom to do everything for you. You know what I mean? Yeah, I see you, mom. And, you know, I had to learn it. It was up to me in order to be able to have this experience. I had to be the one to call the people on the phone and tell me I wanted to do this. And yes, I did need my support person there. Shout out to you, Ariana, who was there for me when I did this. But evidently, because I was able, to, because I was able to do that, I had this great experience, and now I'm clear in what I want to do in the future. And I thank. BRV just for giving me this experience because if I didn't, oh my god. And um, as for my future plans, it's not really set in stone. Everyone knows where they want to go to college, and I'm still figuring that out. But potentially, I might go to PVCC and possibly transfer to UCF. I want to go to a school in Florida. Don't judge me. Um, but I want to take one of Lighthouse's um, summer programs and definitely make a short film for myself and have that experience. And even though as much as I would love to just go straight to film school, at least know the basics. Self-teach myself before I let somebody teach it for me. And so with that, does anyone have any questions for me?
Um, hi, Mom. Yeah, you want to go? Um, speaking up, definitely talking to people without my mother <laughs> there. <laughs> you know, um, as much as I am a people person, when I don't feel like I can connect with the person, it's very hard for me to convey what I want to that person. So that for me was very hard, but getting over my jump, a leap, I was able to open up my mouth and portray what I wanted. And to be able to overcome that challenge, I feel like I've uh, matured as a person. I'm gonna skip. Yes. Um, like growing up, I used to make really small videos. I did a lot of music, please don't judge me. But um, during that time, um, I wanted to be an actor and being in front of the camera is definitely what I wanted to do. But um, when I started watching behind the scenes projects of really small things, even like a music video or just short films, I realized this is such a fun thing to do being able to be the artist behind the project it was it was like an eye opener for me it was like a light bulb in my head and was like i want to do that and you know there if i had the opportunity to be in front of the camera i would take it but being behind the camera and being able to be in control of that project oh my gosh that's a dream right there um ariana Um, it was definitely difficult for me because, you know, I struggled with a lot of communication things when it's not like with y'all or with somebody that I know. It's even hard for me to communicate with my teachers and ask for help. So when I had to realize I couldn't lean on someone to do it for me, it was very hard for me to accept that. But at the end of the day, um, I'm grown, well, I'm growing up, not grown. I'm growing up and I wanted to take that initiative to do it for myself. It took a while, you know, it took a while, but I did do it. Ooh. Um, I definitely was surprised at how creative I could be. I mean, I I mean, I do daydream a lot. So, I mean, I have a creative mind just going throughout the day, but um, I ended up taking one of the classes at Lighthouse and I had an opportunity to make a small short film for myself. And the fact that I was able to come up with ideas on the spot and be able to broaden them was surprising to me. So to be able to, um have so many bright ideas and to be able to create that into a project was definitely surprising for me um anthony Um, I definitely had that idea of doing both. Um, it wasn't necessarily me being the one filming before I really was like, I want to be a filmmaker. I was like into uh, visual effects and special effects and editing and things like that. If you, you know, follow my TikTok, but um, things like that I was more interested in, but knowing that the film industry is such a broad thing and you can go in so many different directions, I didn't want to stick with this one, you know? And as a filmmaker, you can, you've seen like directors be in their own movies. And so with that, I think I would want to do something like that, being able to go in all different directions and not be able to stick with just one. Uh, Elizabeth.
Um, uh, I guess I guess I can say that it was. I didn't really know I wanted to do film until like last year, so I couldn't really jump at you know getting the classes and opportunities that we had here because I was so late in realizing that. So I really realized like I had to venture out outside of school and you know learn it for myself, which was hard in itself. But I generally kind of am glad it happened that way because it made me take initiative to achieve my own dream and you know to take steps where I don't have to depend on people to teach it to me. I can use these resources that I have and be able to learn it for myself. Kristen. Ooh, that's a great question, Kristen. Um, I definitely had to think about that. See, for me, the director is in control of everything. The director is the one who is leading the people, making the scripts, telling you what to do, where to be. That director, all in all, is the main person to create that great experience for someone. So to see, for me, to see a director take advantage of these young minds who just want to be a part of this great project that they grew up on, it's, it's very hard, hard for me to witness that. So for me, if I wanted to take the director role, I wouldn't simply be thinking about the project in itself. I also would have to think about everybody else because I don't want everybody to be a part of this project and be like, I wish I wasn't a part of this. I wish I wasn't a part of this toxic environment. I want, as a future director for myself, I want to be able to create an environment where everyone feels comfortable and we all can contribute to this great project that will influence a bunch of other people. Thank you. Thank you so much. Touch now. See you later. There you go. Thank you for the introduction, Mr. Morrison. My name is Aiden Melton, and I'm here today to present to you all my BRVGS Senior Castor Project on Efficient Building Design. Perfect. All right. To start out, I'd like to say that the reason why I chose my topic was based off of my future career interest in civil engineering. Uh, when we were talking, when I was talking with my senior mentors, Ms. Esch and Mr. Morrison, in April of 2022, we are looking at different ideas for interests and hobbies I had that ranged from candle making to material design. Uh, after saying no to those, we decided to 
uh, look at possibly career interests. And I thought that this project would be perfect for exploring my future career and seeing if it was the right option for me, something I want to stick with throughout college and uh, future. So before we start the presentation, also I'd like to define what exactly is efficient building design. Efficient building design it can be based off of three factors, the structural integrity of a building, the economic advantage, and also the environmental benefit of a building. All three of these can define if a building is efficient in society or not. And the first part of my project was my professional learning experience, which I had the pleasure of interning with international company Setting Associates. I know this slide guy was a little slower here, so let's see if it'll work. Come on. Okay, so it worked and I just went a little too far ahead. Perfect. All right, so sorry about that little technical problem there. Um, I interned for a Sesame State Associates is a systems engineering company that focuses on the safety and health of buildings, where they work with uh, fire protection, plumbing, and HVAC systems. My personal mentor, Joe Dalyu, uh, was more focused in the HVAC sector with his office, and he is the Mid-Atlantic Director of Operations for Setting Associates. So his area is located actually in downtown Charlottesville, and uh, his office is located right behind the Bradbury Cafe, if anyone knows where that is. And that little, in the bottom image down there, that little area back there is this actual office space. The top image is the meeting room where we would often meet and I would shadow different lectures or meetings that he had with other companies. One small part of the internship was the projects that he would provide for me. Uh, this one up here is a project that he was given by Virginia State University, where they sent him a lot of files of the construction of the building and the different parts of campus and showing where exactly the HVAC systems were set up. Uh, my part in this project was to reorganize and rename the files so he can easily access them for a future project of revamping and modernizing their HVAC systems because it was a little bit outdated and it needs some innovating. Another notable project that I got to work on was there was a particular client around the end of my internship that requested for him to look into air curtains for a delivery truck doorway. And going through that presentation uh, with him, uh, I had researched what exactly an air curtain was and the different types of air curtains, the cost of air curtains, and manufacturers. Overall, exploring to see is this the best option for the client or not. The bigger part of my internship was a lot more shadowing and lecturing. In this particular image, more of what he did was he talked about a lot of what Setting Associates was founded on and also what he had to say Associates does. In that image, it might not make a whole lot of sense and it looks a little bit messy, but on the right side uh, over there, he focused a lot, like I said, with HVAC systems. And on that right side, he's talking about uh, the different kinds of heat sources that can be in a room. For example, we are an uh, example of heat source, or the sun is a heat source. The projector down here is a heat source. All they can get trapped into a room and make the room rather uncomfortable. So it's his job to figure out a way to displace the air in that room and replace it with something more comfortable through different HVAC systems and cooling coils, such as this one he drew out right here. Overall, my internship, not only did it provide me an explanation of what a systems engineer does, but he also was willing to teach me exactly how to be the best engineer possible through, A, he taught me how to find a job as an engineer, uh, find different projects to work on. And then he also explained to me um, different like college advice tips that he, that he was found throughout his engineering experiences. The second part of my project was focused on my research paper directly after the internship. And my research question I was trying to answer through my research paper was, how can we design buildings to sufficiently sustain their integrity while also avoiding or even supporting the growth of the natural environment? Uh, to make this a little bit more simple to understand here, I was basically trying to explore, is there a way to increase the longevity of our buildings while also increasing the longevity of the environment at the same time? My paper is set up in this format where half of the paper talks about the actual physical aspects of the building and then the other half talks about the environmental aspects of the building. And on the right side, I have all of my environmental uh, points listed out with negative environmental impacts of construction, water conservation, energy conservation, and natural materials. And the other half of the paper was focused on architectural history, building techniques for stability, strengthening technologies, and material strength. All these came together to prove that there is a way that we can do this, it's just there's not one answer for it. Starting with architectural history of buildings, 
Each of these buildings have stood the test of time, and I believe that it's up to different engineers and architects today to decipher what types of techniques and materials did people use back in the day to make them stand for so long, so that way they can employ that into a buildings today, or maybe even in innovate them and help our buildings stand for as long as these have. And as you can see down this lens right here, this isn't nearly as older as these buildings, but it still has a significant impact as it shows a shift in environmentalism with this minimalist uh, design, the windows for natural lighting, and then also the raised platform so nature can grow underneath it. Overall, that, that right there is actually the Farnsworth House located in Illinois, and this is one of the few houses that have started to employ environmentalist ideals into their architecture. One more folks on the physical stability techniques though, one of these technologies that people employ today is ICF walls. ICF walls are a three layer walling system with the exterior and the interior uh, covered with a, not fully fireproof, but mostly fireproof material. And then in the middle, you would pour concrete to hold it together. Overall, like I've mentioned before, these are fireproof. So that is one thing that can help them stand against uh, different natural elements. But on top of that, uh, the three layers help the walls stay stable for a much longer period of time. Overall, making sure that the building stands up for a longer amount of time also. And then one, another aspect of physical strength that I talked about with actually my mentor's coworker was uh, wind aerodynamics on tall buildings and skyscrapers. As you can see here, uh, when wind hits a building like directly face on, like that flat surface, it'll just push on the building and cause it to sway, uh, loosening the integrity of the building at the base. So engineers and architects today have worked extremely hard to figure out ways to divert the wind or direct it in a different direction to avoid the damages that wind can cause. Some modern examples today that we can see here are the Transamerica building, Patronus Towers, and the Kingdom Center. All of these different modernized buildings uh, show different ways that either divert wind, direct it in a different direction, or just allow to simply pass through to avoid having that wind destroy the integrity at the bottom. And then as for materials, um, obviously the stronger materials you use, like steel and concrete, uh, the more strength that the building will have. But we can also employ natural elements into materials also. Up here is an image of a green wall, and there's such things as both green walls and green roofs. These have very environmental impacts on um, buildings today, where in urban environments and rural environments, we can lower the heat in the area by 23%. That's been statistically proven. Also, it lowers carbon dioxide emissions and increases oxygen levels, providing a healthier environment for people living inside the building. And also, depending on how you design your green roofs and green walls, it can have a really nice aesthetic look. So overall, you're not sacrificing any kind of beauty for your building by putting these in. And now, more shifting towards environmentalism in my paper. Um, there is this thing called an IoT system that can create smart houses. What is actually an IoT system? It stands for the Internet of Things. And the IoT system is a data collection center that takes different pieces of information about the environment, whether it be lighting levels or temperature. It will take that data and analyze it and then respond to it appropriately. This can be employed in fire safety, security, lighting, and HVAC systems. And the overall environmental benefit of it is energy management. Because if you're not having to consistently watch you know, the thermometer and see how cold it is outside to respond appropriately, the house will actually do it for you Therefore, you know, reduce the amount of air that you might be blowing that you don't need to blow, or reduce the amount of light that you're using that you don't need to be using. Overall, this can provide a lot of energy management and energy conservation for a building. Another environmentalist technology that's used is gray water systems. Gray water is any non-potable, and also there's no fecal matter in it, water, that is recycled throughout the house. And usually how it works is we can use the water however we need to, as long as you know, it's not toilet water, um, it'll go straight through a septic tank to a filter system, and then it goes into a recycled water tank and is used throughout the house however necessary. This is extremely helpful in an agricultural community because most water conservation um, or water usage comes from farms and gardens. So by using this kind of a system and taking less water out of the natural environment for these different areas, we're able to actually reduce the amount of environment impacts we have on habitats by pulling out water from those areas. And then one last final piece of technology that's been growing recently in America is 3D printed houses. Um, right now, the most main material used for this is concrete. And while they're not the most aesthetically pleasing looking houses um, at the moment, they could be in the future, uh, at the moment, they do provide a lot of environmental benefits and promises. One of those being 
uh, there is almost zero, there's lower carbon dioxide emissions from transport of materials. And also, there's uh, zero, almost net zero waste coming from these buildings. Because what you put into the system is all that the system would create for you. So once you do run your tests on it, and you see that the building is created exactly to your specific parameters you give it, you do not have to worry about you know, extra wood being thrown out somewhere and not being used and just sitting out. For the last part of my uh, project, I worked on my community service, which I was thankfully able to complete about a couple weeks ago. Um, and I focused my research or my community service project in the woodlands. The woodlands, for those of you who do not know, is the natural trail system that's located in FCHS's back is FCHS's backwoods over here. And it's also run and maintained by Fulvana County High School's SGA class. It was created by the SGA class back during COVID to allow people to escape the interior confinements and allow them to just go out into nature and enjoy it as it is. Now, this uh, trail system does feature some risk factors, though, as I ta tackled one of them. They have a few rocky paths in the trail that these rocks are always loose, usually, and they can increase risk of injury through ankle twists, uh, bruises, broken bones if you fall over. Um, and this also provides much more risk for cross-country runners and also senior staff members here. As I have talked to those people and they said, please, we want something to be done about that. So my solution to this was I was going to build a bridge across this. The first part of building the bridge was getting materials and donations from local companies. Thankfully, within one day, I was able to get material donations from Fluvian East Hardware and Better Living up in Zion's Crossroads. And Fluvian East Hardware was able to provide every bit of hardware that we needed, and Better Living was able to provide all the lumber that you see on the screen there. All that uh, only came from businesses. There was no money spent on this bridge at all. The second part, after we took us back to my grandparents' house, is we prepped the wood by measuring it and cutting it out. And after struggling with that saw at least five times and messing it up severely, um, we actually finally got all the cuts perfect, and we've decided uh, to prototype it to see if it would stand for a really long time. And putting it together, as you can see in that top right image over there, it fit perfectly. And that ridge right there is originally 22 feet long. After we went back out and measured the woodlands again to see if it would fit the area, uh, we realized it was actually six feet too long. So we had to cut down six feet and made it, it's now a 16 foot bridge that's out there. Once we fixed everything up, we took it to the Fluminium County High School and we had 14 SGA members thankfully help us out. I like to just quickly commemorate those SGA members as they're just easily, just quickly willing to help and just jump in there. And I'm just very grateful that they turned a more than one day project into 45 minutes. So thank you very much for all the SGA members that helped out. And also with their help, we were able to complete this bridge uh, by that evening. On the left image is the skeleton of the bridge that we had put together. And thankfully the ground is already pretty level. So all we had to do was just set some rocks up to make sure that the middle was well supported in some way. And after that, the last part of it was literally putting on those decking boards and it was getting pretty dark. So if you go down there and see some screws kind of strayed off like that, uh, that's why we couldn't see what we were doing out there. But the final product looks something like this now. And after testing this out with 30 SGA members walking over it the next day uh, and seeing that it doesn't shift or it doesn't um, uh, lean or bow at all, uh, this bridge has proven itself to be a valuable asset to the woodlands and has now decreased the amount of risk that cross-country runners and other walkers will have when going through that particular area. My mentors for this project were uh, SGA teacher Mr. Small, uh, my grandpa Harold Yancey, and my father, Jonathan Melton. All these people provide excellent advice and were able to encourage me to keep on going, especially when things got a little bit tougher with trying to find materials or building it and find some mistakes here and there. Overall, they're just great sources of advice and encouragement that I really needed. My future plans is I've, after high school, I plan on going to PCC for one year to get my associate's degree and general studies. And I plan on transferring over to UVA into the applied, the, okay, hold on, there you go. The, uh, the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences to earn my bachelor's degree in civil engineering on a construction engineering and management track. Now, my advice for future seniors. One thing I would have done differently is I would have started my community service project earlier. I didn't realize how long it would have taken. I didn't realize how much research was involved in the community service project. Um, I didn't realize that certain companies like have certain times that they work, especially for construction projects. So 
I found that to be something that caused me to be about four months late with my green service project, which thankfully it got finished and now it's beautiful looking in the woods. Um, another piece of advice is I personally enjoy doing my senior internship during the summer. Uh, because during the actual school year, you're going to be focused a lot more on your community service project and your research paper, which that alone can take up a really long time. And your internship can also take a lot of time. If you, but if you do it in the summer and just doing that thing, you won't feel overwhelmed by doing it. You actually get to enjoy what your mentor has to tell you. And then my last piece of advice is to uh, stay organized. Um, through this project, I have learned how to use folders in Google Drive, and I especially did not use it before. <laughs> And I had like folders for this presentation, uh, my research paper, my internship, all of those different uh, folders and the different labels I put under things, it really helped make sure I could find stuff more easily and allowed me to make sure I can stay up to track with certain things. And without further ado, I'd like to just quickly uh, point out that I really glossed over a lot of the different parts of my project. If you all feel like you want any more details in my internship, community service or research paper, I have a QR code up here to take you straight to that website, or there's also a link up there in case you're not able to scan it. Um, but finally, I'd like to just quickly thank you all for your time, and I am opening the floor to any questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Oh, yes? Yes, actually. That's why I want to go for the construction, engineering, and management track, because I like to focus more on the construction aspect of it. Bridges and roads are interesting, but I'm more interested in like the actual physical skyscrapers, big, larger industrial buildings, part of civil engineering. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, there is. Um, depends on the type of materials you use, though. If you're using a lot of natural materials, um, then that can be less beneficial to the environment. But if you're using more synthetic materials for concrete or you're using more like alternative ways to doing it, um, that can benefit the environment in itself. Thank you. Thank you. Good. I'm so sorry. And you will use this clicker. I'll point it at the screen. Perfect. Computer. Which computer? That one? That one's on there. Okay. Okay. Go back. Go back. Got it. Okay. Jenny. That's your sound. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're going to sort of stick in the same uh, minority Hi, I am Ryan Wilkins, though many of you know me as B. 
and my senior capstone project focused on the trades with an in-depth investigation into carpentry. My overall topic and why. So while it may seem strange that I have a picture of my dad and my stepmom on the board, I can promise you there is a reason. My dad, for about as long as I've known him, about almost my whole life, has been a carpenter and has run Northeastern Carpentry. He has made such amazing creations that I've always thought it was gorgeous what he could create. And so I was always very interested on how you could do this. So I joined Carpentry One in 11th grade. And whenever I had questions, I could text him and he'd be like, well, this is how you do it, kiddo. And even when I hurt myself on the sander, he goes, yeah, those hurt, don't do that. And so that just really helped me push through Carpentry One, even through some guys saying, oh, you're a girl, you can't do this. But I was able to do that. And now I'm in Carpentry Two, and I still absolutely love this. So my dad has always said that there is a lack of young people in the trades. And this just comes from colleges being pushed more than the trade system is. And so when I joined Carpentry One, he was ecstatic. And so this actually pushed me to my research project, which focused, which the first half focused on the growth and decline of trades. Now, like I just previously mentioned, this started, the, the decline of trades started when college was pushed more. This started around the 80s. And so therefore we see a growth in college applicants and a decline of people applying to the trades. And that is still happening today. And we can still see that here. So what we see here is the proposed job openings from 2018 through 2020 on the left, which is around 10 million. And then here we, we compare the enrollments through the two years of 2016 and 2017, and that is just under a million. So if this keeps on the projected track, by 20, 20, 2028, we will have a gap of 10 million people in the trades, and those are not being filled. So that actually led me to my second half, which was my, uh, minority and women involvement in the trades. Minorities have been constantly pushed down in many other aspects of life, but the trades are not, uh, they also do that. So, they, so minorities typically worked mud laying jobs, such as masonry, stone laying, and brick laying. And so in order to combat this, President Kennedy released an act saying that there should be more government contracted construction workers bringing more minorities into those higher, higher trades, such as construction being um, plumbers, electricians, things like that. And President Nixon actually followed that up with the Philadelphia Act, which is the groundwork for affirmative action in the trades. On the women's side of things, women face many issues harassment, sexism, and just men overall thinking that this is a man's job and that they cannot do these. I personally actually, in, my, in both of my carpentry classes, have faced a few of those guys, and it makes it really hard to push through. I've just been pushed aside. I'll be trying to lift something like, I can do it, no. And so it just re it's really discouraging. And this also comes with women also just facing more, uh, they're more prone to pain and injuries in this line of work because of the lack of ergonomically designed tools, such as there is a miter saw that in my class I cannot lift and hardly a few of the boys can lift. There are like three boys who can actually lift it and it's almost impossible for me to lift. And this can cause, especially in greater line than the real world of carpentry, causes so many more injuries in women. And this, and a few of the trades such as plumbing and electricians can actually cause things such as pregnancy loss. This, uh, this discrimi not discrimination, this difference actually can start in apprenticeships. For plumbers and electricians, around 50% of women drop out of their apprenticeships. And when you get to trades such as carpentry, around 70% drop out. So that, there's a big difference. And that is shared through and the lack of women in trades is shared through everyone. And that actually brings me to my internship. So the sentiment about the lack of young people is also shared by Worthington Architectural Millwork, who I served my internship with. They are located in Gordonsville. Now, when I contacted them, they were very happy to see the fact that a young, a young person, let alone a young woman, was interested in working with them. So my mentors were 
Mr. and Mrs. Worthington, along with Mr. Harvey and Mr. Tom. So Miss Alicia, Miss Worthington, is right there, and she helped me with my with designing my project. They were kind enough to let me design my own project and build it, and so I ended up building a yarn cabinet for my twin. And so you can see me and you can see her and I designing it there. We actually faced some difficulties with this, and so Mr. Harvey, who you can see his hand at the very corner, he rolled over and helped us out when we were confused about the program. Now, Miss Alicia, she is very good at her job, and she was very enthusiastic about the fact that there was a young woman who not only wanted to follow in her footsteps, but also follow with the more hands-on side. She and three other women worked in the office side, and there were no other women in the carp in like the hands on the building side. So she was so enthusiastic about that, and we had such long conversations about it, and it was amazing. Now for the hands on side of it, Mr. Jason actually took me, and he paid for he actually paid for all of the materials to build this yarn cabinet. And so there you can see me with the oh my goodness with the machine that will cut the wood down to length. It's automated. It was hands off. I actually pressed a button down at my feet and held my hands up like this because I was a little scared of it. But it did basically my job for me. And so there we see the finished project. And it is actually currently in our room, in uh, mine in law's room right now. And it works great as a yarn cabinet. And I still am very thankful that they let me design my own project. I was actually assuming that I would just be doing kind of odd jobs for them, sweeping. No, they actually were very kind to me and let me build my own project. That's actually, it actually ended up being about like $700 worth of wood that they just let me have. And it, I'm so thankful for that. That taught me not only about how much the wood costs, because actually here we mill our own logs and we have our, there's no cost to it. But then I was very astounded about the fact how much it costs. But it also just taught me appreciation because my dad actually worked with Mr. Tom when he was learning and there was a point in time where Mr. Jason looks at Mr. Tom and goes, hey, you know her dad. And he goes, I do? He goes, yeah, Darren, Darren Wilkins. And it was just hilarious because he was like, I taught him carpentry. Well, I taught him cabinetry and now I'm teaching you. And it just shows you how interconnected everything is, even in this decline, especially in this decline of uh, jobs. And then my community service is ongoing, and I am currently doing a overall collection of what I would call odd jobs for the community. So my current project is I'm building a display case for Miss Payne, one of our teachers, to hold, memor uh, to hold memoirs of her late grandfather who served in the war. My actual, my, actually my first project was building a set of stairs for a disabled dog. Unfortunately, I lost contact with the person who requested them, so I ended up donating them to the SPCA. Here you can see my uh, conversation with the SPCA, and I, I unfortunately dropped them off on a day that they were closed, but I was able to donate them, and I really hope that they were able to util utilize that well. What I learned from this internship is the fact that, as cliche as it sounds, the best way to learn is to teach. When I wasn't building those dog stairs for the woman, I was helping out with Cherokee's Carpentry One class a little bit. This helped me solidify some of the things that I was a little too scared to do in Carpentry One, such as like put the table saw at a specific angle or cut these really tiny pieces of wood into a specific angle on the miter. And it was not on the miter, on the uh, table, no, on one of the saws. I can't remember the name at the moment. But um, it really helped me solidify the things that I, I knew, but I didn't entirely know. My future plans are to attend JMU and major in biology while minoring in pre-med. I do hope to keep woodworking up as a hobby alongside of this but I would like to put my education first and then continue woodworking. My advice for upcoming uh, Blue Ridge seniors is to be okay with the uncomfortable situations. Like I said with the saw that I had to press and put my hands up like this, 
it's okay to be a little scared. All of those tools that I saw and that I used in the shop with uh, Mr. Mr. Worthington, tools I had never used before. They were all new and they were all very fancy compared to what we have. And it was a little nerve wracking, but in the end I was okay with it and I saw some of the tools that I knew and I had used before and it was okay. It ended up being perfectly fine and it's okay to get a little uncomfortable. And that leads me to the end and are there any questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. I honestly think that 100% uh, affects that because like I said, I've had experiences with that before because there are a few guys in my class who, even last year, I had them in my class last year, they'll come over and they'll think they can do the job for me. And that really makes me mad. Like, Ed, if I didn't love this so much, I probably would have not continued this. But, and I understand that while I am smaller than them, sometimes I cannot pick up things, but it still is very frustrating because, like, even some of the tools that I mentioned, like some of the guys can't lift it up and they'll come over thinking that they can because they're bigger than me. And I'm like, you can't lift it, dude. Neither can I. So it's it does 100% affect it. And there is a lot of sexism in the workplace, especially in trades, because it is typically regarded as a man's job just because of the nature of it. So I do feel like that contributes to it. Yes. So strangely enough, even through all of this discrimination against both of them, specifically minorities, they tend to actually play a bigger role, but the opportunities for higher positions such as like contractor or some of the managers, they are often filled by white men. So like more women work in the lower field and more minorities work in the lower field, but there is no opportunity for them to get up. I actually spoke to my mentors about this and Miss Alicia mentioned, they both mentioned the fact that uh, Latino communities, women or not, are very subjective to you're going to stay in the lower field because people, there's just a lack of opportunity to them because of racism and sexism. Yes, mom? I actually did not, but something that my mentors have mentioned is the fact that they, that while almost all of these surrounding counties do have CTE programs, they are not advertised within the school. Like I saw the Carpentry One program and went, oh, I didn't know that was on the thing. I c and I could have done it a few years ago, but I've only done it now because I didn't know about it. So. Absolutely, because one of the things that I think has actually started happening within the past few years is we've been having a CTE night, and I haven't been able to attend either of them, but they it's specifically CTE. They go down to Cher, Mr. Cherico and Mr. Jennings' room and all of the other, like they, I think it's basically all of the basement floors, and they show what people who are going to trade schools instead of college can do. So I think that is helping, but also a little more advertisement would be better.
give me a second. I'm actually going to switch out because the clicker's kind of acting up. Yeah, so I'm going to just switch out. I'll be right back. Okay, I'm going to have to switch back in. I can't switch back out. So what we're going to do is take a break here, uh, wait for fourth one to Yes, thank you. That on it? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Just for the computer? Yep. Okay. Okay. So that it catches the voice. So okay. Down here. Mm -hmm. And then you have the up up there. Yeah. So that's a good thing. This is the clicker. So, yeah. So this actually is, is uh, a laser pointer? It is laser, but you have Heck to, yeah. you can't just touch it lightly, you have to like hold it down. Okay. okay? And then um, and so you can practice that. And then this is forward and backwards. So take a little practice run. The computer's actually over there, so you want to point it. There's the laser. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Laser. Let me try it. Laser. So okay. Better to aim at this. Yeah. There you go. Cool. So okay. When, so when you're up on stage, I got it. don't click it at the screen. Yeah. Screens. It should work. We switched it, so hopefully this will okay. be better. Okay. Yeah. So take a deep breath. Share your story. Yeah. You, you know, you've done the hard work. Mm hmm. So I, I know the laser. You have to push it down. Yeah. Because I didn't think it was working, but then. He sat and touched it, and then she okay. would it. So yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, for those of you just joining us, uh, welcome. We are in the home of the um, And so far, uh, all the things so far have been fantastic. Right? Uh, we appreciate all that. Now, uh, we got four more. So we're going to start uh, with a talk about local farming. Let's bring to the stage. Hi, so my name is Lexi Wilkins, and clearly I did a project on local farming, but it wasn't just about um, like big local farms. My, my specificity was on the small local farms that often just run under the radar. And so Newcastle Bee and Berry is an example of the local farm that I worked at for my internship, and it's a really fun farm to work at, honestly. He's got strawberries, blueberries, he's got chickens, he's got blackberries, but only the strawberries are like a you pick. So it's a lot of fun to work there and it, it provided a great experience. And, and so why I did this project was because it's been a big part of my life. Like my mom has a really big garden and she's had, and it's been growing since we moved out here. Um, but in Fluvanna, it is definitely an agricultural community because like you could get behind a tractor on the road going to school. You could be the tractor on the road that's in front of people going to school. And like, it's just, something that our community is built around. And it's been something that I've been considering as a job since I started enjoying it. Like I did not enjoy gardening or agriculture for a little while. And then eventually as I grew up, it, it started taking more of an interest or I started taking more of an interest in, in it and it's different forms. And so, nope, that way. And so if I can click again, my research question was basically, how, does, how do local farms affect the eco economy, ecosystem, and education of, around it? And so what I found was that small farms like this, with all of the, uh, hello, with all of the, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, with all of the things just not tilled up, it provided a great experience, a great, a great habitat for po local pollinators, um, local animals to just thrive in, like he, he takes care of bees, and so all of these clover in the front, they were there, they were there to provide for his bees so he wouldn't have to feed them. Um, he wouldn't have to maintain them except for what they were maintaining themselves, and except if they swarmed, which then he would have to take care of them. But so if I can go back, they also provide a great educational experience. And around here, it's not very hard to find someone who has a garden or has a farm. But in urban areas, it is, it is really hard to find a local farm because they're just not able to be set up. And so these community gardens that people have started setting up in, in urban areas, while for the first few years they're not as, as successful with educating people on healthy eating and healthy habits and how to grow food, after they've been established and word has gotten out about them, they explode with, they, they help the ecosystem, they bring pollinators, they reduce po pollution because they absorb all the water or a lot of the water, and they actually clean up the air. For the education, they allow people to learn how to grow food for themselves to eat, 
like a lot of these people who come to these community gardens end up making their own little garden at home because while the community garden provides a great experience for them, they learn to do it and they just do it. And so economically it also helps because like in food deserts, they when you establish one in a food desert, they are, it, fast food is no longer the only opportunity for these residents to get food, but they now have this little source of income that they can have, even if it's like a, you come maintain your plot for $15 a month or something. It actually provides a little income for themselves because they learn how to grow them and they grow and sell these their crops at home. And so with chickens, you don't normally get them in the city, but if you do, it provides the exact same experience just on an animal level. And so for my internship, which I've already talked about, I served with Mr. Bob Jones at Newcastle Bee and Berry. And for my internship, he just kind of told me a task and let me get to it. Like the first day I was there, I was cleaning out bee boxes for two hours in a greenhouse. And like he went and did other things. He trusted me as an adult. And so I learned that it was a lot of farm work is basically like this very, you have to trust people to do their job and do it well. And I made sure to do it well, but it's just, you gotta, you gotta know what you're doing. And so I did end up getting poison oak, but it was still overall a very good experience because I learned how to actually work in that field. And so for my community service, it's currently ongoing. I do have a plan. But yesterday I actually served with Ms. Mayo and Ms. Dana in Central Elementary for, the Na for National Agriculture Literacy Week. And basically we went to classrooms and we read kids a book and it, it was called I Love Strawberries and it told the story of how this little girl loved strawberries and so by the end they all wanted to grow their own strawberries even if they had no clue how to do it but it was they they were introduced to how things actually grew and one of the classes had actually just passed their plants unit and so they were asking us all these in-depth questions and it was great experience because I got kids as little as pre-k asking me questions and so I hope to continue or I will be continuing my community service with Miss Mayo it's just a matter of scheduling issues right now and so for the things not related to the project but related to me are I learned about myself that I can get really impatient sometimes. Like I would email Miss Mayo and Miss Mayo is not someone that I can actually easily get a hold, of, a hold of because she is so busy with her job. And so when I would email her, it would be a few days before she responded and I would just be constantly reloading my email. And so I learned how to take a chill pill basically and check it closer to once every day because I knew she wasn't gonna be at her desk all the time. And so another thing I learned is that I really love taking care of plants and animals because, uh, I don't know, I guess I'm just a nurturer because it's really, it's really fun to see things grow because of the effort that you put in them. And last one is agriculture is not something that I would do as a job. While it is something that a lot of people don't expect to get into. Like it's something that I've been really interested in since I was like 13. And so I, w I was really looking forward to going into botany in college or whatever. But I don't think now that it's something I would go into as a profession, but go into merely as a hobby. Like Mr. Bob Jones that I showed you, he doesn't run Newcastle Bee and Berry as his only job. He actually works in a, as an electrician in Richmond. So a lot of the times it's just, it's not a sustainable job even if you don't, if you do it alone. And so my advice for future seniors is basically the opposite of literally everyone else has said, take your time. It doesn't need to be done all within a month or a week. Like, yes, it's really important to not procrastinate and not put things off, but it's also just, you can't rush it or else you won't get anything out of it. Um, <clears throat> my next one is keep a to-do list because with all the chaos of a senior year, you won't be thinking of everything you need to do. And you might have some late assignments. I know I did. But that's why now, whenever I get, get an assignment, I literally put a box on my to-do list and I write it out. So I know when that's due and I rank it as a matter of importance. And so planning ahead is not something that I thought I would have to do as much as I did. But again, with a senior schedule, you have to learn how to manage your calendar. Like it might seem that this project is 
yet, but I have one month out, or I have two months out, just to be able to know when I have availability. And the last one is to pursue your passions. Like, it's, it's what everyone else has said, but you gotta pursue something you're interested in, or else you just won't get anything out of it. Like, if I wanted to, if I wanted to be, if I wanted to do what I wanna do now, and I pursued computer science, I'd be so bored, I wouldn't even know what to do with myself. It would just be something that I couldn't be able to do and learn about myself from it. And so, my future plans, there they are. I'm gonna to go to ODU and major in marine biology, which is the thing that I chose over agriculture. And I want to become an in-field researcher because I do have this connection with life and I really want to continue to develop it. All right, I don't have a next slide, but it would be questions. Basically, just not the in the lab analyzing data. I want to be out there collecting the data. Deep sea marine biology and marine plants. Anyone else? Aiden? Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Oh, he sells strawberries, blackberries, uh, pies. I don't think he sells eggs, but he does sell blueberries when they're in season. But the strawberries are the only, or the strawberries and the blackberries when they're in season are you pick. Kirsten. Um. I'll come back to that, honestly. Like, if, the, if no one else an, asks a, has a question, I will answer that, but give me a second. I gotta think. Aiden. I didn't, I didn't do much research into this, but honestly, I feel like it's produced more, like, little plots of land being used as a garden or something, because a lot of people didn't venture, venture out of their house for a while, and so they had to either get delivery like for produce or something or they were just like you know what i'm just going to cut out the middleman and do it myself and so i feel like it's brought a lot of people to that even if they don't think they have a green thumb mom oh yeah <laughs> Yeah, I really do because they're a very big resource in in these communities because they do they do need fresh fresh produce and and things that they can that they can learn how to grow. And so a lot of them like they just have no knowledge and if they did, they would significantly learn or significantly learn. They would learn significantly how to actually grow these things and do it for themselves. And this is actually shown particularly in immigrant communities that once they learned how to grow things here, they just did it. There was no uh, prompting. So an urban desert is where they don't have access to like groceries or some or, uh, groceries easily. Like a lot of the times it's hour out of their way, like hour and a half. So they ha they would have to go and get them ex instead of in instead of just like the really fast food chains around there. I wouldn't think so. The most common, actually, they're out in California, where it's just highly urbanized, and then there's just no, um, no grocery stores anywhere. Um, anyone else? Or Jackson. Yeah, um, a lot of them are uh, minority communities, specifically black and brown communities, like you said, and they just don't know how to garden here they don't like once people show them how to do things they just they just know or or they start by themselves and they start spreading the knowledge so all right
Kirsten, I'll, I'll get to your question. <laughs> yep. I actually picked strawberries at Newberry. Yeah, he's awesome. He is. Awesome. Okay. Where am I put this? Um, you can put it on your tie. Yeah. Just like. Yep. Put that on there, and that's just for the computer. All right. Beautiful. Um, this is this. And this is about here. Let it catch your place. Um, there's a box up there. This is the one I'm looking for. Yes, that's a good spot to stand. I'm gonna give that to you once your um, slide shows up. So this is the um, the laser. Mm -hmm. You have to actually really push it down, it doesn't, it, and then it'll show up. Okay. okay. Um, and then this will be forward and backwards. Once it's up there, you can do a little test and do the forward and backwards and test the laser. Okay. okay. So it has to give her a chance to like get it up there. And this is this is already on. It's on. So. And then just wait until Mr. Yeah. Morrison announces it. So. Okay. But once it yeah, just give it a second. It has to load and then. Yeah. And take a deep breath. Make sure that you're fine. It's only a few minutes. You yes, ma'am. You can do anything for a few minutes, right? Mm -hmm. so, and you remember to breathe. Yes, ma'am. Breathing is important. Okay. <laughs> All right, so you want to take a card test? Um, Let's see. Yeah, click it and see if it's good or not good. And, and if it doesn't go, you can always go towards that computer down there. Okay. okay? Oh. Because it, it's, it's talking to the computer down okay. there, not this one. Yes, ma'am. You're too great. Okay, thank you. Alright, so uh our Okay, um, my name is Cash Marsh, and uh, this is, I did my senior capstone presentation on the significance of special education. Um, before I get into it, I want to go over a quick table of contents, kind of get, um, kind of give you an idea of what I'm going to cover. Uh, I'm going to go over why I chose my topic, why it was so important to me, and uh, why I didn't choose anything else. Uh, my research question, and my research findings, and then uh, my internship, community service, and uh, personal gains from the project as a whole. Um, uh, my personal relationship with special education. Uh, special education has always been like pretty prominent in my life. Um, around 2017, I was introduced to a special ed student that um, was actually a, a foster child that came to live with me for a couple of years. And he had a severe intellectual disability that really hindered the way he went about his everyday life. Um, and it gave me like a completely different understanding of how personal a disorder can be. Um, and I really don't think that I would have pursued this as my topic if I hadn't met said student. So, um, my research question is, what kind of difficulties do students with special needs um, run into when transitioning from high school to the real world, and uh, how can those difficulties be overcome? Some of the biggest things I found in my research were that um, students with disabilities face workplace discrimination a lot, and um, a lot of the times when they're transitioning from high school to the outside world, um, the lack of one-on-one -on -one assistance is a big um a big thing because they're used to a lot of kind of just help with everything they need help with and it's a lot more independent. Um, uh, legal documentation can be a big issue for uh, students with disabilities after high school because it's like, I mean, it's, it's confusing for me and uh, I can imagine how confusing that would be for somebody struggling with a disability. Um, one of the some of the biggest things that um, you can do to overcome these disabilities would be uh, look at the government support programs out there. There are a ton of um, pubs online that will give you a lot of information about um, legal documents and um, 
requirements for assisted living programs and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, there's a lot more help out there than people realize, and I feel like it just takes some 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 looking. Um, post secondary inclusive post secondary education. I'm sorry is uh, another big thing that people don't talk about a lot because um, after high school, special needs students can 100% pursue uh, a career in pretty much anything they want to. Um, and I think that a lot of the times people don't talk about the uh, college opportunities for them. Um, and there are a, a number of inclusive post-secondary education um, universities around the United States. and um yeah i'm sorry uh, this is my mentor amy hill she is the special ed instructor in room 3411 uh here at Fluvanna county high school and she was a big help uh throughout my whole presentation she really taught me a lot about the iep process and what all went into being a special education instructor she kind of showed me the ropes in the classroom and um gave me a lot of insight on kind of what each student was diff, uh, was was dealing with differently um, because no two people struggle with the same disability. Uh, for my internship, like I said, I, uh, for about, it's fine, for about an hour and 45 minutes each day uh, for over the course of two weeks, I uh, shadowed and interned, I guess, in room 3411 downstairs, and that was a great experience. I really got to socialize and interact with the, the students in there, and um, I took a lot of notes for like the first couple days. Um, I thought that that would be really helpful for my project in the long run, and it really was. I learned a lot about, like I said earlier, IEPs and uh, the possibilities for students after school, um, and it was really just an amazing experience. Uh, all the kids are great, and they were all super enthusiastic about me being in there, and they wanted to know more about what I was doing with Blue Ridge and um, everything that went into it. Uh, it was really a great experience. Um, for my community service, I uh, chaperoned a field trip to the uh, radio station broadcast center in Charlottesville, Virginia, um, and that was really cool. We all had a lot of fun there. The students got to um, take a tour of the broadcast center and see all the different radio stations that are um, on air every day. They got to meet the hosts of each radio station and kind of learn about what goes into that. Um, it's a pretty good opportunity for them to learn about possible jobs after um, high school. And a lot of them showed particular interest in just talking on the radio in general, which is, is really great because I feel like they don't get a lot of um, time to observe that. Um, after our, after we went to the broadcast center, we went to Chick-fil-A and uh, that was really cool. Um, kids really loved that. Um, and yeah, it was just a really good experience overall. I had a lot of fun. I look really goofy in that picture, but it is what it is. Um, uh, my personal gains and significant impact from this this whole thing, I, I really don't know what I didn't gain from this as a whole. Um, it was just a great experience. I learned a ton about opportunities after high school for special education students, and um, I learned a whole lot about the complications of learning because of disorders present in the classroom. Um, it was really, it was really fun. It was a really good experience. I really had a lot of fun and I really enjoyed doing it. Um, I think the kids really liked hanging out with me and I definitely loved hanging out with them. Um, hold on. plans after high school. I haven't committed to a college yet, but I'm looking at some four years. Um, I might possibly go into a trade, like uh, some kind of technical or electrical engineering. Um, I don't think that special education is something I'm going to do as like a lifetime 
job, but I really, really enjoyed doing it while I did. Um, my advice for future BRVGS seniors would be, I'm sure you've heard it like eight times already tonight, but don't procrastinate. That is it's really bad. Um, I procrastinated a little bit towards the beginning of this project, and it was it was pretty intense trying to get caught up. But um, fortunately, I did, and I really enjoyed it. Um, another thing is, I would really, I, I can't stress this enough, um, don't just pick something because you think it's going to be an easy topic to work with throughout the year. I really think that you should pursue something that you're truly interested in on a personal level because it makes... It makes it not, it's not work anymore. It's, it's something you enjoy doing. It's fun. Um, and it was, it was really just a great experience because I love working with students. I, lo I love working with kids. Um, that was kind of quick, but you guys have any questions? Yeah, that, that sounds like a good idea. Thank you. Um, Ariana? Um, well, yeah. I mean, I kind of said that um, I was living with a special needs student for a couple of years, and it really affected the way that I, I mean, I didn't have a whole lot of interest in the subject beforehand, and then I realized how detrimental a disability can be to somebody's day-to-day -day life. And it, I mean, that's the whole reason I started doing this. Yeah, Aiden? Yeah, it's like there's an acronym for it. And I'm not going to lie to you. I forgot the acronym. It's kind of long. But um, there are a ton of online um yeah yeah 100 percent. but there are a ton of um in-person options for that too but uh the majority of them are online you can just kind of look them up if you want um, oh, anything else? Anybody else? Oh. Um, it wasn't as much of the teaching. It was more of that I was, I was helping. You know what I mean? I, I really enjoy um, helping people at a disadvantage. Um, I feel like by aiding these students to learn new things and stuff like that, I was making an impact, and uh, I really enjoy doing that. So. Oh, yeah. Um, I learned that I have uh, a lot more patience than I thought I did. Um, that's for one, and that um. If I just apply myself a little bit more, I can um, really step out of my comfort zone and make things happen. I'm kind of a, a shy person sometimes, and I think that forcing myself to get out there and do this was a, a big thing for me, and it was really impactful. Yeah, uh, Monday. Okay, yeah. Um, so a lot of the times I'd help him with his homework. Um, I know that seems like it's not that 
intense, but uh, he really struggled with a lot of his uh, written work. And I feel like a lot of the times I, I'd sit down at the table and kind of explain to him like what certain stuff meant and uh, why he was doing it, like the purpose of the assignment itself, instead of just like doing the work for him and giving him the answers, you know? I mean, a lot of the times it's really important to explain to a student what the point of the lesson is, what they're, they're gaining by being taught said things. So, um, yeah. I did not do as amazing as I wish I would, but I got really nervous. And then, and then forward, and then the left. Got it. You're a pro. And if, if you want to like talk, you can do the button. You can do all the things on the computer or not. Okay. If it's not clicking, okay. It, it needs to communicate with the computer. The point on All right, everyone, let's hear it for Kat. Next up, we have a look into the arts, uh, which I'm really, really excited to see. I, uh, I've been following uh, this young lady's project for many years. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, Ariana Lopez. Uh, she's going to be doing a My name is Ariana, and I will be talking about um, art as an outlet, looking, looking at the benefits of art in special education. Now, first and foremost, what is my topic? Um, while going through the, um, the process of finding my topic, initially I, was, I already knew I wanted to do the arts, and I later found out I wanted to involve special education. And so it would be, how can art positively influence um, students in special education in the lack of seeing it and implemented in those classrooms? Now, why art and special education? Now, first, um, first and foremost, I will talk about the special education part. Um, next one's a little goofy. <laughs> Um, this is my brother Darius. Um, now, Darius, um, we found out. Well, we found out later that my brother is on the spectrum for autism, and on top of that, he has manic, by uh, manic bipolar, which I believe is bipolar too. And when he was, we found signs of this a little when he was younger. I mean, he would uh, fidget a lot, and um, we would see like we initially thought he had Asperger's and then Tourette's, but then um, as he's grown up, that's worn out. But then we later found out that he's on the spectrum for autism. And he's been a really big help because he's always helped me to reach for my dreams. And I've seen a lot of, um, I've seen a lot of um, things in the school system that I didn't like to see while he grew up. I mean, it affected the family a lot. I mean, sometimes kids with autism or, or with uh, disabilities are looked at as um, not being able to understand things all the way or, um, or like they can't understand anything and automatically typecast is not being able to learn that. So they're just put in these classrooms as like 
a daycare rather than actually trying to learn something. So he was a big help in finding this that I was interested in and seeing is there like, it, can arts help out? And um, what type of things are out there to um, help out with them? And now on the art portion. Um, I have al I've always loved arts. I've been drawing for uh, how many? 18 years now, because I'm 18. Um, as you can see on the, on the left, uh, it's a painting I did of Kobe Bryant um, months after he had died. Um, and I did this for my father because he really loved Kobe Bryant and it was a big thing for, I feel like, all of the NBA that um, he had died. And as you can see um, with both of these, I've, I believe that art is a very important thing and it um, art can connect people and it can also um, make a statement and I've always loved to use my art to um, express my feelings because I've always been a shy individual. Um, so I, I wanted to look at the possible, um, is art implemented in education, special education as much? And um, on top of that, um, uh, how can I combine the two? Has it been combined before? And if so, um, why do I see a lack of it in like these classes that I see today? Now, what was my research question? My research question was, how can various forms of art positively influence individuals with special needs? I picked this wording of the question. It took a while. Um, thank you, Ms. Kelly. Um, it took a while to uh, come up with this question because it was so hard to find a topic to implement both of them, my, my, um, my roots with my brother and my interest in arts. But I feel like this question um, actively shows what I was trying to like portray by combining the two. Um, I wanted to know um, like can, why why should it be implemented? How is it helpful? And show how it's helpful through my research and um, specifically special needs because you know I've I've always I've seen a disjustice done to the education system with them with some classes and um, I want to see how. I can make an impact to further uh, stop that and show different things and help out with their classes. Um, what did I discover during my research? First and foremost, doing my research, I initially wanted to look into the historical aspect of special education. So how are they looked at? What, what, has, what programs are out there to help them? And has this already been done before implementing art and special education? So during my research, I had found out that since the Shakespearean and Elizabethan era, um, I said that right, there is, um, there is definitely a um, negative connotation as it relates to the individuals with special needs. Um, they were seen as lesser than, um, subhuman. Um, they were seen as disgrace. I mean, uh, the list goes on. Um, and this social model only continued throughout the years. And um, I found information that um, there is, there's this thing called the T4 program, which is, which is a euthanasia program um, around the start of World War II, that, um, that uh, around the start of World War II, and this program um, not only um, impacted uh, minorities, black, blacks, um, elderly, and it also impacted people with mental and physical disabilities, and this program, um, uh, took them into camps and killed over 70,000 people. And while researching this, I didn't think that I would find like something this drastic, but it definitely further shows that this social model that was created is, um, that's been created throughout the years has painted people with special needs in a negative light, which was very depressing while researching. But I later found out that this social model since um, has gotten better because they were starting with programs like the Kennedy Center for Performing Arts. Um, it has um, shown that special needs individuals and specifically youth aren't like un aren't damaged, aren't um, lesser than human. They should be treated as everyone else. And this pro um, this program is a national cultural center, which is um, a natural culture center that uh, helps implement arts. It has a special it has a special education class that specifically helps individuals. Um, special needs individuals help um, learn art and learn different forms of art from playing an instrument like um, the flute, piano, drums, to learning with visual arts, so painting, sculpting skills, drawing, 
and this program specifically um, helps, or this program within the center helps with these kids um, actually getting hands-on experience rather than just being automatically typecast as not being able to do so. And um, another, uh, another program I had found was the Academy of Music and Arts for Special Education. It's also known as the AMAZE program, which I thought was really cool because it is a, a free community-based um, program that uh, I forgot exactly what state it was stationed in, but um, with a quick Google search, you can find it. Um, it uh, it's, a, it's a free community-based program that helps specifically with special education, so it's not just a subpart like uh, the Ken Kennedy Center was, and it helps uh, spe special needs individuals, specifically youth, um, get that hands-on experience with arts when looking at the visual arts specter, they will be um, um, painting, they'll be drawing, they'll be getting hands-on experience more, they'll be actually showing their work in galleries, which I believe is amazing, something I've always wanted to do. Um, and with the uh, uh, performing arts, they get their hands on instruments, just like with the Kennedy Center. Um, they get their hands on uh, pianos, flutes, violins, all types of things, and they are able to uh, play musical instruments as quote-unquote normal people do. Um, so uh, I found out with my research that uh, this is just one form of art that they, uh, or this is just uh, the visual arts uh, portion. Um, arts has actually been proven to uh, uh, help out with these kids' um, motor, motor functions, uh, uh, co uh, cognitive um, skills, um, memorizing um, traditionally hard rhythms and patterns, um, understanding harder concepts in school. And um, I really thought, because I only thought like um, it helps with like feelings and like uh, getting feelings out, expressing yourself, but it also helps out with um, mental applications, which I feel like is really cool. And this is just another photo of something that I thought was um, really accurately depicted um, different ways that art can actually help out, which was showing how it's beneficial to all anyone, all individuals of all types. Um, so it says self-esteem over here. Um, recognition, respect, creativity. Well, the self, um, the, the top one would be specific, specifically like where I would fit in mostly, like people that are, um, have like inner creative talent and um, fulfillment, but then it also gets into the other category showing that art is actually can be beneficial to people that don't typically see themselves as artists. So I really liked this triangle for that. Um, what did I do for my internship portion? For my internship portion, I mentored with Miss uh, Kingston of the elementary, uh, our elementary school in Fluvanna, the West Central Elementary School, and she is a special education uh, teacher. And she helps out with um, kids that are typically around three, four, or three, uh, two, three, and uh, four, I believe, mostly in the three category, and. Um, I also mentored with uh, Miss Kings uh, or Miss uh, Lascano. Uh, she is a uh, art teacher for the elementary school. She usually teaches with um, the older kids, so like second grade, first grade. And I don't believe that she uh, has uh, uh, special needs in the, like kids coming in our classroom. So it was good to see that uh, cultural shift to um, with the other uh, art teacher there and. Um, uh, Mrs. Connor, I believe. It was good to see the um, cultural shift between the classroom that gets these um, special special needs kids between the classroom that uh, doesn't and like is more like they, I feel like I saw a shift where they showed like more practices of art in there and they were more promoting art to those classrooms rather than the special needs classrooms. I saw like projects and stuff, but it wasn't like an like at taught as like as much of an important thing that you can make your mark, and with that, I will be talking about my internship with the uh, class uh, the art classroom uh, with Miss Lascano. So for this classroom, the day that I came in, they were doing the kids were doing this uh, dot day project, and dot day is I don't know if any of you remember it's this thing and that's shown in art classrooms. Um, it's this book where this it's about a little girl who sees the art project's being done in her uh, classroom and she doesn't see the point in it. She doesn't see why art is important until the teacher tells her, all you need to do is make a dot. All you need to do is make a spark. 
one little dot can turn into something wild. And when the little girl made a dot, she ended up making, she ended up wanting to continue and made this whole entire masterpiece. And she started making her own gallery and showed it to everyone. And she was shown that art is actually, can help out with things. And like just making your dot in the world is important. So all of the kids ended up um, making their little dots. And I remember helping them out. And then the art teacher being like, this is Ariana and she's from the high school. I've seen her art and she's amazing. And which was nerve wracking because, you know, kids can be brutally honest. And uh, they had me, uh, they asked if I could help out with like different designs. And it was cool because it got them to connect with art more and like being like, wow, she's from the high school. I can maybe do this later on rather than seeing it as like just a class they have to take or like, oh, this is something we get to do and then go to recess or something. Um, and the second part of my internship was with Miss Kingston's class, the special education class that I talked about. Um, during this time, I uh, just, I acted as like a helper. I helped out with, uh, um, I helped out and observed the classroom, how it functions. Um, I met, my first day I met uh, three beautiful little kids. They were so cute and amazing. Um, they, they were amazing to be around. I will not say their names for uh, confidentiality issues and not say any kids' names, but I will just say that this one I will say is S. He was amazing. I remember when I first walked in, he ran up to me and gave me a big hug, which is amazing. Um, I noticed, uh, I noticed that he always wanted his headphones on or his um, ear protectors, and I was like, that's something I always do as a comfort, so it was really cute to see that. Um, and this is just more pictures of the classroom. It was really, it was really cute, and it was really like a, like a flashback to like when I remember when I was going in elementary school, so it was really cute and cool to see. Um, this is just art that's around the walls of the hallway that I noticed. I really, I really, it was cool to see that, um, Past people had made murals for the school for, I think, Helping Hands was just something that we uh, used to do like every year, but I don't really see it as not, uh, much a lot. So um, it leads into what my community service is, um, which my community service, for my community service, I ended up, I always knew I wanted to do something art related. I knew that I wanted to give back to my community, start where my roots were, so the elementary school and potentially give something back. And I instantly came up with the idea to make a, or paint a mural for the school as I saw more around the hallways. And I wanted to paint a mural that really connects the art department and the special education department. So he's, he, um, I'll give into the abbreviation later with my mural. Um, this is, you can't see it, but this is an out, uh, there's an outline on the wall of what I wanted to paint. Um, and this is, or it can just be a before picture since you can barely see it. Um, I, it's an outline of, in the next picture you can see it more, it's an outline of a heart tree. It's a tree with the branches making a heart. And um, I knew I wanted to make like a little hole in the tree, but I didn't know at the time until I started painting that I was gonna make the um, hole in the tree uh, heart related. And um, inside of the hole in the tree, as you can see uh, in this photo, I, um, I painted the abbreviation of the little area down in the elementary school and it's EC, ECSE, which is Early Childhood Special Education. And I wanted to implement that to really show that this mural is um, for the area. It's for the youth to look at, interact with, potentially paint, add more of the things you'll see in the next slide um, if they want to, and add on. So this is how it came out. Um, while going into the mural, I didn't expect it to turn out as well as it did. And um, because of my procrastination, it took like, I had like two days to do it before this week started. So um, I'm really glad I got everything done. I'm really glad with how it turned out. Um, I didn't know until I finished the tree that I was gonna add a tire swing. So that was last minute too. And um, I'm, I'm really excited for how all the hands came out. My, my hands of course were on the top because I couldn't, the kids couldn't reach it. But um, the hands that are closer to the bottom on the bottom branches are the other kids' hands. And as you can see at the bottom of the tree, there are, uh, there's a big handprint and a small one. There was one little girl that came up to me and was like, she was the only one who was like, can I get the brown paint? And I was like, of course you can. Um, but she put it at the bottom and then I put my hand right beside hers and my signature and the date as I do with all of my art. Um, and I really liked it. And the next one will just be photos of it finished with me there and photos of me painting it. Um, ignore the odd angle. Um, but Next is what was significant about my internship in community service. I feel like I feel like it was 
it was pivotal that I got in the classroom because I already know what it's like in my high school, the special education uh, classrooms, because I have a friend who's in that classroom and he comes up to me every day and sees me. He allows me like he's like, hey, come in the classroom. I help out there sometimes. So I've already seen what it's like in high school and through my brother, I've already seen what it's tip or what kids that aren't typically seen like, oh, you don't look like you are disabled or are treated like. So I wanted to see how it is on a um, youth scale. And so a lot, I just went in. I thought the internship was significant because it allowed, it, it, um, it really, uh, my research helped, like it doubled back on what I found out through my research and um, that how it's helpful because I saw a lot of the kids calming down. Like I remember one moment when I was painting, I had came in the classroom with a paintbrush and then one of the kids calmed down while he took my paintbrush, he thought there was paint on it, but he was drawing on the, um, um, he was using it to paint, try to paint on the paper and he instantly calmed down. And I thought that that was adorable because like he relates, um, he relates painting to his area where he's calmed down, but as soon as like we had to take the paintbrush for him, he had started getting riled up again. So I thought that that was a cool thing to experience hand on rather than just reading it in an article. Um, so yeah, um, I also thought that my community service was um, a big, an important thing because with my mural, it isn't the, it isn't necessarily the biggest, and it isn't necessarily like didn't have like as many handprints as I wanted, but I believe that. The mural was important because it used what I was good at, arts, and helped out and give something back that connected not only ECSE, ECSE, but also the art department because the art department was a really big help there. They supplied the paints. They supplied the, oh, that's a great idea. They um, really doubled back that I should do this and that I should get the um, kids' hands on it to like so they're helping out. And I believe that it made a big difference because all the kids coming coming past the um, mural were always like, wow, look. And then the teacher would be, Miss Connor was, would tell them, she, she's in high school, you can do this when you get older. So I feel like that really helped out to show them that this isn't just something that um, is just one of your classes. This is something that you can do when you're older. So I really liked that aspect. And it, the mural came out great, despite doing it last minute. Um, what did I learn about myself through this experience? Something I learned about myself through this experience is that I definitely want to continue do arts. Um, as you can see up here, these are just some of my um, art pieces. I um, I hope to continue arts and um, act, instead of just doing art for myself, give back to the community and um, actually be able to uh, um, make a make a difference potentially and show that art is an amazing thing and um, not just an interest of mine. I want to make this into a career. And um, as you can see, uh, I've been doing this a while, so I really enjoy it. Uh, what might I have done differently if I were to do this project again? Uh, something I would do differently is my time management. I sucked at that. My mom has already told me that I sucked at it, and I. Uh, you know, coming up on dates really just like solidified that. So um, I would time my um, my uh, due date, like thing, like my mental due dates better instead of just putting them off. I would time when I painted the mural, getting more ideas for it. Um, when the kids were actually able to come out and put their hands on the mural, rather than just doing it all last minute. Um, and I would also, uh, I would probably. Um, maybe have more handprints, like of the kids' handprints on the tree to make it more full. Um, everyone else thought that it was great, but I wanted it to be more full, but I guess that's just my perfectionist side coming out. But I would maybe get more, um, I would help to or try to get helping hands back so we can add more to the mural. So it's not just, I feel like it was just a simple tree um, with a tire swing and their hands. I feel like maybe we can add more of a scenery thing, like maybe a bench, like a park bench and like some animals, some bushes. Maybe I would add more to the mural and make it more so that the kids can actually help out painting rather than just doing a hand. Um, and what advice would I give to future BRBGS seniors? I would definitely say, uh, as everyone has said today, do not procrastinate. Um, that's a big one. Um, just because um, you can do it tomorrow doesn't mean you need to do it tomorrow. If you have any downtime, you should make sure that you are, act, like even if it's little by little working on this project, because doing it late is actually, it's not rather while you're like, oh, I have more free time. It's not a good thing to do everything oh, I could do it tomorrow because then the due dates are really going to be catching up on you. And another thing, like um, other people have also said, um, actually pick a project that you're um, interested in because I remember that 
when I was picking my project, I was, my instant thought was, I'm just going to pick something to get it over with and get a good grade because it's senior year and I do not care. Um, but they showed me that I should actually care about my project because how, like, I've been in Blue Ridge since I started my first year of high school. And um, this is my chance to show what I've learned through my high school years. This is my chance to show what I'm interested in and actually display it to people. Like, this is my time to shine. And this is something that I um, truly loved doing. I mean, it was amazing. I love that I got to paint a mural like, um, like that was my own design for the first time. Um, so it was great. And what's in store for the future for me? I um, hopefully, after doing uh, going to Piedmont, um, doing community college for one year with all my college credits, I would only have to do it for one year to get my associates. Um, I can transfer over to JMU and um, really look into uh, majoring in fine arts. I mean, I initially, uh, uh, I, I feel like this project has really helped me to come out of my shell. I mean, um, even being able to stand in front of everybody like this, um, uh, it's helped me uh, with communicating with everyone, like all my mentors. It's helped me to try to push and do more things. Like I, I joined my speech and debate team at school and I hope to continue that um, hopefully, um, Lord willing, in uh, college, and I hope to continue doing little projects like this, coming back, giving back to my community, and um, yeah, so that's it. Do I have any questions? Oh, okay. You. Yeah. <laughs> The um, I as as one does when they're an artist. I go through Pinterest a lot, and um, I had found like I've always drawn eyes. I I grew up saying all the time like I was some angsty teen. The eyes are the window to the soul, but like actually they really are. Eyes are like really like people say like hands are really hard to draw, but just like hands, they're different, and I like everybody's different, and I feel like. Um, drawing eyes rather than just the realism versions. I like semi-realism and um, uh, that eye specifically, I knew I wanted, I had just got like these um, new Prismacolors and I just got these new watercolor stuff and I wanted to do something that wasn't what I traditionally drew. So like I didn't want to just do a realism eye with like the skin parts on the side. I wanted to do something that was cool. And so the rainbow drip came later and also, people were always doing like those drip designs on shoes, and I was like, I want to be involved. So that's also something I did. So, Anthony? Mm -hmm. I mean, I would definitely call like computer science and art, like um, you are creating something, like whether it's coding, which I've done before, like, or like any type of hyperfixation. Like I know my brother hyperfixates on um, Michael Jackson or a lot, or like knowing the latest facts about history or like um, always dating stuff. I feel like they, um, there's always like these hyperfixations that come in with kids, um, specifically on the spectrum of autism. I know a lot. Um, um, they hyperfixate on something and that is their thing. That is what calms them down. That is something that they gravitate towards to calm them down or to just show and as a way of expressing themselves, their interests. And I know that that might be what's going on. And I know that's also happened with my brother. So I would say that, yes, it is a form of art. So in their own way. So. I hope I did OK. It's really warm. That thing for dear life. Okay. Do you like that? Have it. You have it. You have so much to share. Just take a deep breath.
Uh, good afternoon. How are you guys doing? Um, my name is Abigail Adams, and I did my project on uh, animal care and the science behind it. Um, so to start us off, um, I want to impress upon you the concept that an animal's care and health is directly correlated to the um, biochemical processes that make them run. And those biochemical processes are in turn directly correlated to how we, as animal caregivers, manipulate their environment um, that and manipulate the environment that they stay in. Uh, so my overall topic, in other words, is how happy science equals happy animals. Um, so to start, us, why I chose this topic um, is because two of the things I love most in the world are animals and science, and you smush them together, and you get biochemistry and veterinary medicine, which um, is what I hope to pursue, and so it um, it really meant a lot to me to be able to work with these um, two major aspects of my life. And up here on the screen, you can see my dog, Brownie, and my horse, Jack. Um, and so originally, I knew that I wanted to explore what some of those major biochemical processes were and how they worked within the body, but I found that this had to be expanded to how we as animal caretakers manipulate those biochemical processes through environmental factors. Um, and what I discovered through my research can be broken down into three topics, and that's the nervous system, nutrition, and animal development. So let's start off with the nervous system. What is it? The nervous system is the compilation of trillions of neurons that send and receive electrochemical signals throughout the body. It's broken down into two main systems, the peripheral and central nervous systems. The central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system is everything else. Now, how does it send these electrochemical signals? Well, it all has to do with neurons. So let's look at some neurons here. This is a neuron. You can see the dendrites at the top and then the soma, which is the body of the cell, and then the axon and the terminal buttons. And the axon is surrounded by a glial cell of um, the myelin sheath. So let's introduce an electrochemical signal, just see how, this, um, how the signal transduction works here. So there's the electrochemical signal up at the dendrites. The dendrites send it down through the body of the soma to the tip of the axon where it has to build up enough action potential to be able to reach the threshold energy level to shoot through all those segments of the myelin sheath. So it has to build up enough positive ions to be able to go boom, 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 all the way through the um, segments of the myelin sheath, shoot past all those negative ions, and get to the other end of the terminal buttons, where then it is packaged up into a neurotransmitter, also known as a hormone. So that was a lot of science. What does that have to do with our animals? So if your horse is walking through a field and it steps on a rock, the rock perforates the bottom of its hoof. The brain sends the message to um, walk down through the central nervous system into the peripheral nervous system, which stimulates the muscles in the leg to move and make that step. The rock perforates the bottom of the hoof, called the frog, and sends up a message saying, hey, we have a hole in our foot. The brain sends that back down and says, yeah, that hurts, that's pain. So the horse steps on it, feels pain, pain signal goes up. But a horse is a prey animal and they have to continuously move in order to avoid predation. So the brain keeps saying, you have to keep walking. So it goes, walk, pain, walk, pain. And what does that mean? It means you have a horse limping around a field. So how can we prevent that? 
what most farmers will do is they'll go through and take out any big rocks from any from all of their pastures in order to avoid um, abscesses and this hoof pain. And that's just one way that we can manipulate the environment that we provide for our animals to um, better promote their health. And the next up is nutrition. And there are three main parts of nutrition, and that's water, minerals, and vitamins. Water is very important. Um, it makes up 80% of a body's mass, and it does all kinds of things. Um, it regulates body temperature, it dissolves and transports nutrients. And just to put in perspective how much 80% of the body mass is, the average cow drinks 12 gallons of water every day. Uh, so in order for us to properly provide for our animals, we have to give them an adequate enough supply and a clean enough supply of water for each animal to be able to consume um, that 80% body mass every day, which is why oftentimes you will see large herds of animals centered around a pond or river or drinking from multiple troughs. Um, most vitamins and minerals are um, provided in manufactured feeds. However, if you have a purely grass-fed animal, they will have to be supplemented and they come in bags that look like this yellow thing on the left here. Um, and vitamins have all kinds of responsibilities and there are a lot of vitamins. And deficiencies in vitamins can cause um, have a major detrimental effects, such as the deficiency in vitamin A in domestic pigs, which leads to night blindness and swollen legs, the deficiency of vitamin D in horses, which leads to osteomalacia or the softening of the bones. Now, there are also a lot of minerals. However, the two most important are sodium and potassium as the role they play in this thing on the right here, the sodium potassium pump. Now, how this pump works is that it um, maintains osmotic equilibrium by pumping um, two potassium ions into the cell for every three sodium ions that it uh, pumps out of the cell. And what this helps us do is maintain um, the uh, maintain the equilibrium for the cell membrane um, to aid in uh, signal transduction, which involves neurons that we talked about earlier. It aids in sperm motility, and it aids in um, the filtration of waste from the blood in the kidneys. Um, and now let's talk about the consequences of poor nutrition. When an animal does not have um, all of their nutritional needs met for a prolonged period of time, it will first enter into catabolism, which is the breakdown of all the stored fats in the body. And then it will then enter ketosis, which is where you see ketones appear in the blood and the urine and nitrogen excretion will increase. And then finally, um, after there is not enough blood in the bloodstream uh, to maintain uh, proper brain function, the animal will enter hypoglycemic shock and eventually die. An animal experiencing poor nutrition will, will be slow and unsteady, have um, sunken eyes, sagging skin, and a swollen face. And they're like this calf that you see pictured here. Um, and their stomach lining will ulcer, and they will, their bone marrow will become gelatinous. Um, so that was all the bad stuff. But what happens when you have good nutrition for your animals? Well, that's development. Um, the development of animals starts and ends with cells, and it's the same for us humans. So the cell cycle plays a major role in development. Now, cells are asexual reproducers. They reproduce in two steps, interphase and mitosis. They spend the majority of their time in interphase. However, um, they do go into mitosis in order to reproduce, which is um, pictured here. Um, they have those five stages pictured there, and it helps with all things um, development in utero when you're trying to develop the fetus and um, body maturation outside of the uterus. And it also aids with um, healing. So if you get a cut on your skin, the cells around the wound will notice that there's no one else next to them and they will undergo mitosis in order to fill that gap in your body. Um, knowing all that and um, how scientific -y that was, <laughs> um, I knew that I wanted to learn how this directly applied to animals. So I did my internship with Dr. Jeffrey Shane, who's an equine veterinarian. Um, with James River Equine Services. And for me, it was a trial run of what my life could be. Um, I've always thought that veterinary medicine was very cool and interesting, and I've always loved working with animals. And so this was just a way for me to test out and see, hey, is this really what I want to do? And um, over there, it's my mentor, Dr. Shane, working with the horses in the field. And we always like to joke around and say that it looks like he's conducting a horse choir. Um, so let's go on a little journey here. This is the first day of internship. Um, this is me helping my mentor float teeth. So horses' teeth never stop growing, and eventually 
they grow so long and get so pointy that it hurts the inside of their mouth. And so what we have to do is go in there and flush out everything, which you can see he's doing with that syringe there, flush out everything inside the mouth and take a big electric file and go down and file their teeth so that they're all flat and level and their mouth sits just right so that they no longer have that irritation on the inside of their mouth. Um, so that's what's happening here. Um, and this is an example of a pre-purchase exam. We saw this horse on my third day of internship. His name is Joe. <laughs> I love that name. Um, but so pre-purchase exams are very common in the equine industry. Um, many people will have the vet come out and just check and make sure everything is okay with their horse um, before buying. It's the same as buying a car. You wouldn't want to buy a car that doesn't work right. Um, so you can see here on the left, Dr. Shane listening to the respiratory function, and on the right here, checking those teeth. Um, there we go. This is another example of a pre-purchase examination. It's more on the extreme side. Um, most pre-purchase examinations don't involve using an x-ray machine. However, this one did, and it was very interesting. Um, so you can see Dr. Shane with his portable x-ray machine there. And this one, this x-ray in the middle is um, of the hock and the stifle from the side angle, and you can see the kneecap included in there. Um, and then the one on the far side is from the front underneath the horse. Um, and you can see on the left this little bit of swelling here, and that's what caused Dr. Shane to do the x-ray in the first place, just to make sure there was nothing amiss in the kneecap. And this is Paul. Um, Paul um, presented me with a very awesome opportunity to see how arthritis develops down the vertebrae in the neck. So now I get to show all of you. Um, this image on the left here is of Paul's head. It includes his brain here, his eye here, and his big open cheek here, um, as well as the start of the neck vertebrae with C1, C2 right there. But what I really want to focus on is these joints right here, as you can see in C2, C3. They're called a ball and socket joint, and they're in all of our vertebrae. Um, and what arthritis does as it has progressed down Paul's neck is it slowly spreads apart these ball and socket joints. Now what happens in arthritis is fluid comes into the joints and breaks down the cartilage holding the joints together. So it winds up, separate, whoop, nope. it winds up separating these joints out. Um, decreasing mobility and increasing pain. And as you can see, it's the largest right here on the C6, C7 vertebrae, right by Paul's shoulder. And so he was having a whole lot of pain right there. Um, and that's me taking the x-rays of Paul's neck. I was in charge of holding up the lead block and Dr. Shane would be on this side over here with the x-ray machine. Um, okay, um, <laughs> these were real field situations that I was in. And there are examples of real field surgeries in here. Um, I suggest that if you are a squeamish person, you turn your head, um, but here we go. Um, so this is Dr. Shane emasculating a horse. Um, <laughs> you can see him here on the left cutting into the testicle sac, and then on the right here removing the testicle. Um, these are some fully removed testicles. Um, this is a singular testicle, and that's the pair of testicles, and you can see here the anatomy of the testicle as a whole, you can see the main sac here where the semen is produced, and then this tube here, which leads to the penis um, for ejaculations. Um, if you want to see a video of a castration, you can go onto my website. I have a video linked there for a more in-depth um, version. Now, this horse was a very special case. Um, the owner called us because her horse was experiencing prolonged heat and uh, basically that's the menstrual cycle of a horse. When she's ready to reproduce, she will go into heat and produce this discharge uh, here. So we came and um, it was obviously causing some irritation and the, um, the owner just wanted us to make sure that everything was all right. And so what Dr. Shane was is he came up and he did an ultrasound as you can see over there. Um, and this is what it showed us. So over here on the right, you can see the bladder and all the mucus that has settled to the bottom and you can also see that it's very distended uh, which it's, it's not normally supposed to be so there was a big backup of urine which is what that discharge turned out to be um, so there was a big backup of urine here in the bladder and then connecting the bladder to the kidneys is the ureter pictured here on this diagonal it's also very distended on the ultrasound screen it's only supposed to be about the size of your pinky and it was about triple that size so the urine backup goes back through the ureter and to the kidneys pictured here, all these little squiggly lines are urine. 
Um, and unfortunately, we did discover that there was nothing we could do for this animal as the urine blockage had backed up so much so to distend the kidneys to span the entire left flank and disappear into the abdomen. So since there was nothing to be done for this animal and she was in immense pain, she was put down. But the owner did give us the opportunity to explore just what went wrong inside of her body and allowed us to dissect her. So this is me helping Dr. Shane get to the kidneys. Um, the kidneys are stationed way back here. Um, and so we had to remove all of the digestive tract in order to reach them, which is, this is a very good example of the digestive tract. And we did wind up puncturing the colon so you can see all of that digested grass there. Um, and this is the bladder, the ureter, and the kidney over here, and this is the dissected kidney. Over there was the real problem in the bladder. We discovered that this animal had cancerous bladder tissue, um, which meant that the lining of her bladder had actually thickened so much that it prevented proper urination. Um, and the, bladder, the cancer had spread to about here on the ureter, causing that backup to be even more of an issue and causing the kidney to become distended and cause that tumor-like substance that we found on the ultrasound. And as you can see in the dissected kidney here, there's a lot of crystallization and it's very inflamed from having to hold all that much urine. Um, I had a lot of fun with this project. That's me holding the testicles that we removed from the horse. <laughs> um, this project, it was, <laughs> it was really fun and really cool. I loved getting out there with the animals. I loved working with Dr. Shane. And I loved this opportunity to be able to get this hands-on experience because you don't really get that a lot before you go into vet school. And it, it gave me the opportunity to actually know that this is what I wanted to do. Um, with that being said, we can move on to my community service. Um, I knew that I wanted to do something that directly benefited the animals in our community, so I decided to run a donation drive for the Fluvanna SPCA. Um, it started out in May. I went from business to business um, up at Science Crossroads in Orange County and in Charlottesville. Um, I went to PetSmart, Tractor Supplies, um, Walmart, CVS, Food Lions. I went all over the place and I even went to multiple different vet clinics to try and solicit donations for the SPCA. And then once the school year started, I brought, it, I brought the um, drive into the school systems. I had a joint meeting with the principal of Carey's Brook and Central Elementary School and I had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the principal of the middle school. And what wound up happening was that in the lower elementary schools, I um, with, I created flyers to go home with parents, and each class had its own adopted animal that it would raise its donations for throughout the first semester of the school year. And in the middle school and the high school here, um, I would collect the donations um, as they were ready. Um, and so these are some examples of the boxes that were around the schools. Um, this one was at the middle school, this one was at Central, and this one, I'm very proud of that, I painted that box. <laughs> and it was at Carrie's Brook. This was Kim from the PetSmart in Charlottesville. She was the very first person to give me some donations for the SPCA, and I was very glad that it got off with a bang. Um, I received these donations of May of this past year, and ever since then, the drive has been progressing and gaining more and more popularity, and I was very proud that um, I was able to do this much for the SPCA. Um, these are all the donations that came from Carrie's Brook. Um, again, I'm very proud to see the community involvement um, furthered by all of these donations that came from Central. And this one right here warmed my heart. It's a little baggy. It says, For Lennox, Love Julian. It's got the picture of Lennox right there that he cut out from his letter that went home. And um, it just re really made me see how the kids connected with each of their animals and um, really let me know that they saw what I was trying to do. And it warmed my heart to see um, this kind of participation, and it, it made me feel all warm and fuzzy. Um, and this is Sandy. She's one of the managers at the SPCA. Um, she was very nice. I worked with her throughout the majority of the drive, um, and she. I even went to the SPCA uh, for a day, did some community service um, there, um, where me and her played with kittens. <laughs> Um, so my impact, I am very happy and proud to announce to you that I was able to raise over $1,500 worth of donations for the SPCA um, since May. Oh, well, it didn't work. 
there we go, $1,500 worth of donations. Um, and I'm very happy to see that I was able to provide so much for the animals at the SPCA so that they don't have to go hungry or have a lack of stimulation. Um, and I learned a bit about myself. Um, first was how to deal with rejection. Um, I got rejected a lot going from business to business. There were a lot of hard no's, but I had to just kind of say, okay, thank you for your time and move on to the next place. And um, it really helped me um, understand, you know, what people like in a pitch and what people don't like. Um, and I think that information will really help me when it comes to entering the job force or even applying to vet school, which leads me to the reaffirmation of my career choice. Um, so I definitely want to be a veterinarian now. Um, but it also left me with a secondary career choice, which is working within the school system. I really loved working with the principals and all the teachers at the elementary schools to get this drive running and to just work with kids and <laughs> uh, get kids interested in the SPCA. Um, but things I would do different, I would make it bigger. I had originally planned an adoption event slash carnival that would take place in April. However, I could not get things lined up correctly, so it never happened. I would also be more involved. I had planned a day where I would go to the schools and uh, talk to them about adoption and um, grooming your animals and what to feed your animals. But again, plans didn't line up, and so it didn't get to happen. But if I could do it again, I would certainly do those things. Um, and advice for incoming seniors. Um, the first is that rejection is good. It helps the project move forward and it gives you ideas to help either make the project unrejectable or move forward to find someone who won't reject it. Um, next is that you have to worry about the impact, not the grade. The grade is not nearly as important as what you can do for your community or how your community can make you feel through that help that you give them. And um, next, you have to have fun. A lot of people have said it today. You have to pick a project that you are passionate about or else it'll feel like a chore. Um, to me, this project was not a chore. Um, it was an honor to work with Dr. Shane, um, to work with the school system, and to work with my mentors, Ms. Esch and Mr. Morrison. Shout out to you guys. Um, and it's been an honor to be in Blue Ridge Governor's School because I know that I would not be who I am today without this program. Um, I would not be as um, academically disciplined or sure of myself, and I would not be graduating high school with an associate's degree if it were not for this program. So thank you so much for that, um, which leads me to my next takeaway is that it was worth it. Every, every late night spent studying or writing a paper, every grueling class was worth it to get to this point where I know that I can achieve anything I put my mind to. Um, it was worth it to have done all this to be accepted to the Virginia, to be accepted to Virginia Tech to double major in dairy science and animal and poultry science with a focus on free veterinary medicine and a minor in education so that I can become a farm veterinarian and then come back to the school system afterwards and make other people fall in love with this science as much as I have. Any questions? <laughs> Uh, yes, Kirsten. Um, I will work with um, any animal, mostly uh, farm animals, because it's increasingly difficult to find veterinarians who will come out to farms because you can't bring a large farm animal to a clinic. Um, so I want to be able to provide um, farmers with that kind of veterinary care. However, if I am given the opportunity to work with exotic animals, I would like to do that as well. Yes. Uh, yes, he said that one of the main reasons that there are such long hours is because Many people do not want to go into the science as before, and so there's not as many veterinarians to go around and do that. And he said that it's, um, it's a matter of inspiring others to want to do the science, as well as knowing your limits and um, being 
confident in your abilities. A lot of veterinarians will be unsure of themselves or be wary of what they have to say around people. Um, but as he said that as long as you're confident in what you're um, saying to owners and you know your limits, like your working limits, you don't overwork yourself, that you will be okay. Um, but he did say that it's going to be an increasing issue over mental health if we do not get more people involved in the business. Yes. I was able to collect souvenirs. Um, I was able to bring home a donkey testicle and, um, and uh, the uterus from the horse that we dissected. And so I have those. Yes. <laughs> yes. I have lots of photos. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I can't feel my knees. <laughs>